Don't worry, Mayor. Take good care of him. Once I get him working in the fields, he'll be in good shape. I know you will. It just doesn't make it any easier to see him leave home. You still have that show pony? I do. Well, if you need any help with him, you let me know. I'll send James over when I can, and he'll keep an eye on him. He's not doing too good. Had the vet out again. He's kind of colicky. Hasn't been eaten. I don't know what else to do. It's a shame. I know how you love these horses. Yeah, well, you take good care of them for me, okay? We will do. I understand. Yes. Monday? Okay, that sounds great. All right, we'll see you then. Okay, thanks. Bye. Lizzie, if you need us, all you have to do is call. Lizzie. Lizzie. Your mother was talking to you. Lizzie, this visit is going to be good for you. Whatever. You're still abandoning me. That's not true. No. No. You'll get some fresh air, clear your head, spend time with Grandma and the horses. Okay. Lizzie, if we could stay with you, we would, but we have to work. Yeah. You know, it really sucks being kicked out of your own house for Christmas. I know, sweetie. I know, but you'll be all right. see this face? Do I recognize it? Yeah, thanks, Mom. It's hard getting out of the city. I know. So, how are you? You look lovely. Oh, thank you. How's business? It's good. Yeah. Busy. Busy's good. Mm -hmm. So, where's my granddaughter? She won't get out of the car until we leave. Really? Mm. Um, you have no idea. It's been rough. Hey, why don't you come out and say hi to your grandma? Hi. See what I mean? Uh, well, strong-willed, moody. I wonder where she gets it from. <laughs> it's called being a teenager. She'll be fine. Well, I hope this time away will be good for her. I'm sure it will. And it'll be nice to have somebody here living with me, too. So can I get you a cup of coffee, fix you a snack before you hit the road? Oh, we have contracts. We have to get in first thing in the morning. It's a really long drive. I wish we could, though. Yeah, I understand. We'll see you okay. later. Oh. Good to see you. So good to see you. If she gives you any trouble, let me know. I'll come pick her up if I have to. I'm sure she's going to be just fine. Now, you guys drive safe. <laughs> Miss you. Bye. You want something to eat? No. Something to drink? Stupid. How about we go for a hike? I hate nature. I'm just gonna go to my room. You want help unpacking? I'm fine. Your bags are in your room. This is a horrible picture of me. I love this picture of you. I look stupid. Okay, let's go for a walk. Now.
Didn't you guys used to have a lot of horses here? Yeah, me and your grandpa used to have seven. Do you miss him? What, your grandfather? Yeah, of course I do. What do you remember about him? He'd give me a dollar every time I'd visit. Figures. Why don't we go take a look at my pony? Where are they? Keep going. She's so cute. Something wrong with her? He's very sick. He's got colic and well, I had the vet out to look at him, but he hasn't been eating anything at all and I don't know what else to do with him. I don't have the time to sit here and just be with him all day. I've tried everything I know. What about the rest of them? I, um, I couldn't take care of him anymore. So you just gave them away? No, Lizzie, it's not as easy as that. It's not important right Not now. important. I know exactly how they felt. Nobody wants me either. You are wanted. And you're very much loved. What's this one's name? You know, he doesn't have a bar name yet. I couldn't come up with a name that I thought would fit, so... I thought that you might want to name him. Seriously? Yeah, but you have to take care of him. That's the deal. If you name him, you take care of him. I don't know anything about taking care of a horse. Raising horses is in your blood. It's going to come to you. I've never done it before. Well, he is very sick. And he needs a friend right now. And frankly, I think that you could use one too. What do you say? Hmm? I don't know. A horse has to really, really trust you. And um, you can't force it. And for some reason, this is my last one. And I have not been able to contact with him. So I just want you to try. What do you say? You got a deal? Hmm? Okay. Deal. Brought you some fresh towels. Thanks. Your mom got me that. Did you know that? Cool. Yeah, I love the snow. I wish it snowed more here. What about you? If you could do anything you wanted, no restrictions, what do you want to do with your life? I don't know. I guess... I guess I'd want to be somebody important and do something good. Like not helping people? I guess. I just don't want to be obsessed with my job like my parents are. Hmm. Yeah, it's whatever. Okay, well, I'll leave you be now. If you get bored, you want to read a book? Your grandfather's got some down the hall. He used to read everything. How about grilled cheese sandwich and some tomato soup? Sure. Okay.
Well, now what's beating you? Can't find any of those stupid horse books anywhere. There's a white trunk in my room. I bet you they're in there. Hopefully we didn't give them away. Where are you going? I'm gonna go be in the barn. Do you have any carrots? This book says horses like carrots. What about dinner? I gotta go. Well, we eat at six. Don't be late. Okay. Hey, boy, look what I brought you. Something, babe. One. Why won't you eat? Hey, how's my horse doing? Good. Um, he's liking his new home. Dad said we're gonna start training him tomorrow. Oh, that's great. Yeah. How's everything else at home? Pretty good. It's uh, just busy. There's a lot of people coming over for Christmas. That should be nice. Yeah, it's just hectic. What, not a fan? No, I like it nice and quiet. I get a lot more work done that way. Did you get my little project finished? Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Yeah, it uh, smells good, by the way. Well, I'll have to sit down and have some dinner. No, 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 I, I can't. I didn't expect you to make dinner for me. Just Come on. I told Lizzie dinner was at 6, and it is... And it's almost 6.30, so let's eat. Heavenly Father, thank you for this food, for wonderful neighbors, for this day, for my granddaughter, and help us to use this food to nourish our bodies. Amen. Amen. So Lizzie's staying for Christmas? Mm-hmm. Your parents have to work. Real estate is a tough business. We got a couple of really big deals close at the end of the year. Oh, Lizzie. This is James. James, my granddaughter, Lizzie. Hi. Is that my dinner? Um, I said dinner was at 6, and it's 6.30 now. So what am I supposed to do, starve? No, I'm sure that there's more carrots in the fridge. Ah! <laughs> oh, I should probably go. Don't worry about it, James. She's gonna be fine. She's just a little bit frustrated right now. Will I see you tomorrow? Tomorrow? Yeah, I think that she's gonna need a little bit of help with that pony. I mean, yeah, yeah. I'll have to uh, check with Dad if he needs me to work on the farm, but sure. You tell Phil I said he works you too hard. 
Oh, that reminds me. I promised I'd help him uh, set up the tree. I gotta go. Okay. Thanks for dinner. Thank you. None of these stupid books are telling me anything about taking care of a horse. How am I supposed to know what I'm doing? You told me to take care of him. Let's go inside. I'll make you something to eat. Not until I figure out how to feed him. Why don't we give him a blanket and we'll get you warmed up. How am I supposed to know what I'm supposed to do? You told me to take care of him. I don't know anything about taking care of a stupid horse. It's enough. Okay? Inside the house, dinner time. Fine. This is for you. What is it? Open it. I had a friend of mine make you something. The boy who ate my dinner. A horse. Not just a horse. He was my horse. And his name was Hercules. <laughs> Hercules? Yeah. And he was the best show jumper around. Did you give him away too? I have to go check on the pony. Lunch at noon. name for him. For the pony? Hope. Hope. Yeah. That sounds good. It fits. I know you know why my parents sent me here. But I'm not a bad kid. I know you're not. I didn't mean for it to happen. I just got so tired of everything. Then everything got bad. Why don't you show them you can do something good? What do you mean? Let them know they can trust you. See the good in you. Do you think I could do that with hope? Maybe. Thanks for this. Why don't you clean out the stall? It gets a little bit cold and wet at nighttime. Okay. Yeah. You're gonna be all nice and warm tonight, aren't you? Gotta see this to believe it. Man, that thing's heavy. Yeah, it's heavy. This is a farm. <laughs> Let's go, show me your stuff. All right. Hey. There you go. 
Yeah, he's been eating hay and carrots all night, haven't you, boy? I don't believe this. You're amazing. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna go make breakfast, okay? Be up in 10? Okay. Would you pick up the mail on the way up, please? Sure. <laughs> Good boy. Mm -hmm. Timing. Breakfast is ready. You're gonna lose the ranch. What? This letter says the bank's gonna take the ranch from you. You open my mail? So it's true then. You shouldn't open other people's mail, Lizzie. You knew this was gonna happen, didn't you? All the money. How much? A lot. That is none of your business. How did this even happen? Ever since your grandfather died, I have had to run this place on my own. Putting my horses in shows, winning some money. I've gone through my savings, all just to try and make ends meet. You have no idea what it costs to keep a place like this running. It would have been so bad, but last couple of years, with some early frost, some of the neighbors just about lost everything. Don had a stroke. And Eileen, she broke her hip. So I finally took out a loan on the property to help them out. Why would you do that if you didn't even have money for yourself? These people are like family to me. Ever since your grandfather died, they have been there for me, checking in on me, taking care of me, and fixing things up around the ranch. And what about the horses? I had to sell them to stay current with a loan. Just like that, you sold them? I did what I had to. So you're just gonna let the bank take the ranch from you? Yes. Can't those neighbors help you? Can't mom and dad help you at least? There's gotta be a way, Grandma. I won't ask your parents, and I can't ask the neighbors. They're still struggling, They're trying to keep their own heads above water. I don't understand. The thing is, nobody knows these farms like the people that are already farming the land. But what really boils my bones are those vultures. The bankers and the developers are just sitting around waiting for a late payment so they can snatch up the property and knock down the barns, get rid of all the animals. Put up a subdivision. And that's what they want to do to my ranch. Charles would be heartbroken. So you're just gonna give up? No, that pony was my last hope. I was going to train him for show jumping, win some competitions, sell him and get back on top of things again. And now he's too weak and I'm too tired. I don't have any more time. So that's it then? We have this last Christmas together, you and me. And I'm glad to spend it here with you. There was nobody at the house, so I, I figured I'd come down here. What do you want? Well, uh, Mary said you might need my help. Did she? Yeah, I know a lot about horses. Well, I got Hope eating again, so I don't need you. Leave! Look, I'm sorry I ate your dinner. You know, it's hard to say no to your grandma. She asked me to eat with her. All right, she's like a family friend. You're friends with my grandma? Yeah, 
We've been neighbors since I was born. She's pretty much family to us. Did my grandma give your family money? Yeah. Last year after the bad frost. Why? Then why don't you guys just pay her back? What? My grandma doesn't have enough money to keep this place going, and your family owes her money. So if you guys don't pay her back, she's going to lose this place. I swear I didn't know. If my family could afford that to help her, we would, but I know we don't have that kind of money. So my grandma's just going to lose everything and everyone while you guys just watch? I'm sorry, I don't know what to do. Just leave. Anything about training horses for show jumping? I mean, me and my brother used to ride in competitions when I was younger. So do you? Well, yeah. Come with me. I don't want this to be the last Christmas here, Grandma. Oh, Lizanne, sweetheart, I'm sorry. You can't lose this ranch. Well, what else am I gonna do? You have hope. Hope? Yes. I'm too tired, and I don't have the time to train a horse. Well, I'm here now. And? And I'm going to train him for show jumping, and we will win you the money to save the ranch. <laughs> Sweetheart, you don't know how to train a horse for show jumping. With James and a little help from you, I will. You're, you're serious. You really want to do this. It takes a lot of time and a lot of patience. I know. And I do want to do this. And you know how stubborn I am. What do we got to lose? Awesome. Come on. What? Oh. Grandma's in. Look at this place. There's no tree, there's no lights, there's no garland. This place looks horrible for Christmas. You need to go home, get as many spare decorations as you can, visit other farms if you have to, and ask them for some too. Go now. You better do like she says. And hurry up, Hope's training starts now. I'm gonna go change my shirt. Okay, the first thing you're gonna have Hope do is walk over these poles. Now, he's gotta walk over them. He's gonna be a little bit hesitant, but that's your job. After that, you will run over it and he will trot behind you. After a while, he'll actually like to do it. So it's gonna work on his confidence his gait and his rhythm. It's really important for him to develop that, okay? All right, what else? Over here. What happens here is these two poles get put in the cups on either side. It's called an X. Why don't you hold them for a minute? So one goes in this cup, one in the other cup. Any pony can jump this, but you gotta wait until Hope gets stronger to handle the fences, okay? How long do you think it'll take him to do that? When he's ready, but you can't push him. I don't want him or you to get hurt. I'd never hurt Hope. I know you wouldn't hurt him. You just have to be careful. I know my parents think I'm a total screw-up that doesn't care about anything or anybody, but I'm in this, Grandma. I'm not going to screw it up. I know I can do this. I believe you can. Ready to get started? Yeah. Come on. Come on, boy. What do you got for us? This is all the stuff my parents aren't using. Your leftovers? Well, it's all still good stuff. Here, let's take a look. Okay. 
What do you think? Good enough, I guess. Go ahead and take him on up to the house, then come back out and help me with Hope. We'll be back in later, Grandma. Come on. Oh, that girl. Oh, I guess I've got my work cut out for me this afternoon. I haven't put up decorations in a long time. How come? Mm, kind of lost the enthusiasm once Charles died. I mean, you don't have to decorate if you don't want to. <laughs> no, it's for Lizzie. Yeah, good How come uh, her parents brought her here? Just getting in a little bit of trouble at home. She doesn't seem that bad to me. No, no I don't think she is. Why don't you go help her? I'll take this up to the house. Maybe even take a little nap. You worked really hard today. Yeah. It's getting a lot stronger, too. Yeah. I think I'm going to have him run the exes tomorrow. When did you find out you were coming here to your grandma's? A couple days ago. Do you like it here? I mean, it like must be so different than the city. Yeah. <laughs> do you feel different out here? What do you mean? Out in the country, like, does it make you feel different? I mean, Mary told me that your parents brought you here because of something bad you did. And? I don't know. You don't seem so bad to me. Why not? I don't know. I guess I just don't believe it. Well, you should. You don't know me, so don't act like you do. What'd you do? I got in trouble with a couple of my friends. It was an accident. Stupid. We had a couple of drinks and we all fell asleep. The curtains must have caught on fire because I woke up to flames and screaming. Was anybody hurt? We were all rushed to the hospital because of all the smoke we were breathing in. It was pretty bad. Your parents must have freaked. Yeah. What about your house? It's fine. The firefighters got there in time, so only the living room was ruined. Wow. Yeah. So that's why they brought you here? They're never going to trust me again. But it was just an accident. Yeah, it was, but they're also mad at me for my grades. Oh, are you doing bad in school? Yeah. <laughs> I got suspended. Hmm. Why? I skipped too much. But my parents didn't notice until the principal called to tell them that I got suspended. I've never even had a detention. Well, good for you. My parents had me on lockdown for a week after I was suspended. That's when the fire happened. So that's why they brought you here? It was stupid, I get that, but I'm not a bad kid. And I hate that I think I am. They're never gonna trust me again. They always look so sad when they look at me now. Well, you can't be all that bad. Hope still trusts you. Yeah, I know. That's why I can't let him down. You made this for me? Yeah, it was a gift for you. Your grandma asked me to. Thanks. Wow. What do you think? <laughs> Looks great. I was hoping to surprise you. I forgot what a chore this was. It's a lot of hard work. <laughs> it's been a lot of years since I did all this Christmas decorating. I like being here for Christmas. I like having you here for Christmas. Hope's training is going really well. Yeah. I think you're doing a great job with him. <laughs> Thanks. About it. <sighs> Could you help me with this box over here? Sure.
This place is starting to look pretty incredible. It is. You know, when your dad was little, Grandpa Charles used to decorate for every holiday, every single room in this ranch. <laughs> and then he got sick and it became more of a chore, so I kind of stopped. How long's it been since he passed? It's been eight years. Time flies. Do you think about him a lot? Sometimes I do. Other times, not as much. I tell you, when he died, I sure was mad at God at first. But not anymore? Mm, no. I forgave him. Besides, I know I'm going to see Charles again one day. And I've got so much to be grateful for right here. Grandma, I'm not going to be able to give you a present for Christmas this year. That's OK, sweetie. I was in such a bad mood when I left. I didn't think about getting anything for anybody. I tell you what, you get Hope fit and healthy, and that will be the best Christmas present you could give me, OK? OK. Well, I'm pooped. I couldn't pick up another ornament. Thanks for your help today. Yeah, it was fun. You must be tired, too. I don't know who's working harder, you or Hope. Oh, no. It's so much fun for me. I love him. So have you heard from your parents lately? Have you called them? No. Why not? I don't see the point. Have they tried to call you? I don't know. I haven't checked my phone because it's been off. What if they're trying to get a hold of you? I don't want to talk to them. Besides, they dumped me here for Christmas anyway, so they don't have to talk to me. That's not true. Then why? Because they were worried about you. Whatever. You know, Lizzie, you can handle raising a horse. I think you can handle a phone call. Can I go now? You too. <laughs> right. Let's get you out and do some training today. <laughs> Did you have a good night's sleep, Hope? <laughs> I'm hoping you at least did. Seems like you did. Grandma's mad at me for me not wanting to call my parents last night. I don't see why I should. I've got nothing to say to them. Hey, not cool. Did you know your mom and dad hope? Hey, Mary. Hey, James. Brought more Christmas decorations. Careful, well, thank you. Want me to just leave them here? That's a good place. What are you making? Christmas chocolate pecan pie. Oh, yum. Is it, um, is it hard to make pies? Not too hard. No? Oh. Are you going to ask me where Lizzie is? What? Where? No, I was just bringing uh, more decorations. Just pie. in case you're curious, she may be in the barn. Oh, <laughs> I should have known she'd be with Hope. Mm-hmm. Dinner's at 6. Yeah, uh, what are we eating? James, you came here to see Lizzie, right? Go, see her. Don't be late. Hey, Lizzie. Shh, Hope's resting. Another hard day of training? Yeah.
I could get used to this. You mean the ranch? I've lived on a farm my whole life. Really? <laughs> yeah. I want to go to college in the city, but Dad won't let me go. Why not? Well, he wants me to help run the farm. And you don't want to? Not really. But uh, I don't really have a choice. I'm the only one left at home. Oh, you're an only kid too? No, no. My uh, older sister, Samantha, about two years ago, she eloped with some guy from California and uh, they ran off together. So she doesn't talk to us anymore. Uh -huh. Then my brother, Zach, joined the Navy. I want to go visit him. But you can't? No, we don't have that kind of money. So, Dad wants me to help take over the farm. Well, if you could go to school, what would you study? My mom always says that I'd do great at an art school. Really, art? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She thinks I've got talent, but uh, I'm not so sure. No, you do have talent. You made me that horse. It was beautiful. Nah, that, that's, that's easy. Besides, that's not real art. I mean, I can't, like, draw or paint that well or anything. Well, I think it's real art. Yeah? Mm -hmm. You know, I've got, like, probably about 100 more of those at home. You should really start showing people those. I know they think it's art, too. You should definitely look into selling them. You think so? Yeah. I'll think about it. I just love this view. Yeah. Hey, I need to see how Hope's doing. I just put him up. I need to see how he is progressing now. But he's resting. I know you worked hard. We still got more work to do. I may have to put Hope on the training circuit sooner than I thought. I'm not gonna rush him. Let's get him out. Is everything okay? I don't know. I got a call from the bank, and I just have to see how he's doing. Okay. Yeah, good boy. <laughs> See how strong he's gotten? Yeah, you're looking great. He's looking great. <laughs> yeah, he's not sick at all anymore, are you, boy? <clears throat> I need to see him tackle that fence. I don't want to rush him. Lizzie, if you want me to keep the ranch, he's got to be able to handle that. Yeah, don't worry, Lizzie. That's what all this training has been for. Okay, boy. This is it. You've done such a great job with him. I couldn't have done better myself. Really? Yeah, seriously. So what happens now? You keep training him. He's not quite ready to compete. And in the meantime, I'm going to start looking up some show jumping competitions to enter him into at the beginning of the year. He's not too young? No. He's just going to be competing against other ponies his age. He'll be fine. Good. I want to stay here till he's done with training. Here on the ranch? Yeah. I would love that.
Hope you're both hungry. I know I am. Lizzie? There's a woman with a group of people down at the barn. What are you doing here? This is private property. If you'd like to take a step inside, go ahead on in. Mrs. Evans, I don't know if you remember me. I'm Erin Cooper. Yeah, from the bank. Yes. Who are those people? What are you doing here? They're here to see the ranch. What for? We're choosing a realtor to list the property. What? Mrs. Evans, the bank has been more than fair. You haven't made a payment in six months. I had some unexpected ex Expenses, but I'm, I'm working on rebuilding right now. I have a show pony. This could... ranch is the only reason that the bank gave you this loan of this magnitude in the first place. I'm sorry that you're having personal difficulties. Okay, so now what? Now the bank sets out to search for a new owner for the ranch and its surrounding land. You can't do that. This is my ranch. It's my home. Actually, we can. And we are. You signed a note. You're six months delinquent. The bank is merely trying to get back its investment. I'm sorry. It's just business. Business? No, this is my life. You were warned that failure to pay would result in loss of property. I just need a little bit more time to get him into competition and get him trained, and then I will be current on, on the loan payments. There is no more time. But the show season starts in a month. If you can begin to make payments for the debt that you owe in a matter that will satisfy the bank, you'll get more time to get current on your loan. In what manner would that be? A slight bump to $3,500 a month. Okay. Okay. Your next payment's on the 24th. Of December? That's in a few days. I know. On Christmas Eve? The bank is open till one o'clock. Look, it's simple. Make the payments or we foreclose. Who are they? It was a banker with a bunch of realtors. What were they doing here? They came to look at the ranch. She wants me to make a payment by Monday. I think it's over. No. You said I had enough time to finish training Hope. I thought I'd have at least a couple more months. They have to give you more time. Hope's almost ready. They don't care about that. They want $3,500 on Christmas Eve. Then just give them the money. Pay them. I don't have that much money. This is stupid. What if there was a horse show between now and then? We could win the money. By Monday. There's no shows until the new year. So what are you gonna do, just give up and sit back and watch them take the ranch from you? What else can I do? I am not gonna lose this ranch. I refuse to let that happen. Mm. Lizzie, please! Go. See if she's okay. Are you all right, Lizzie? Would you just leave me alone? I wish I never came to this place. Hey, it's gonna be okay. Don't say that it's gonna be okay. Nothing is gonna be okay. All this is gonna be gone and it's partly your family's fault. Your pathetic, poor family. No wonder your stupid siblings left. <laughs> I just wanna leave this place. 
Would you think about someone else for a change? What? All you care about is yourself. How do you think Mary feels? How do you think I feel? Okay, yeah, I know my family is partly responsible. I can't help that, I wish I could. You don't even realize how mean you're being. We were becoming good friends. You were finally starting to get along with your grandma, and now because of, because of your temper, you're ruining everything. I was happy here. I was bringing hope back to life and saving this ranch, but now... Now what? Now that your plan to redeem yourself is over, what are you gonna do? Your grandma is in there right now, alone. She's having to deal with this by herself because you're in here. Just go be with her. Just go home, James. I never wanna see you again. I'm gone, Lizzie. Good. <laughs> James? I'm sorry I can't stay for dinner, Mary. Well, how's Lizzie? happen to hope I don't know I just don't know you're gonna get rid of him aren't you you don't understand it's not that simple this ranch and these horses have been my whole life When your grandpa died, I had to make some really hard decisions. I don't regret it. I'd still do it all over again. How can you say that? It cost you everything. It cost me a lot. But I helped some very dear friends save their farms and it's only money. Yeah, but you ended up screwing yourself over and all of your horses, including Hope. No. I took care of my horses. And I'll take care of Hope. If I have to find him a home, I will. You mean sell him? Maybe. But I don't want you to. I don't want anybody else to have him. I don't have too many options left, Lizzie. What else am I supposed to do? I can't lose him. It's not the end of the world. Life goes on. Whatever. I'm going inside now. I don't care where you go. A lot of things to think about, a lot of decisions to be made. I'll come inside when you're ready. Yeah, 
Everything. No, no, it's all for sale. Whatever you want. Oh, you're helping me out. Mm-hmm. So this afternoon? That would be great. First come, first serve. Give Bev and Mac a call, too, for me. All right, appreciate it. Thanks. I know what to do. I know how to save the ranch. I'm already making a No, ranch. Grandma, listen to me. You have to trust me. What is it? Come on, follow me. We don't have any time to lose. What are you doing? I am calling my parents. What for? I don't want you to involve them. We're gonna need their help if this is gonna work. If what's going to work? It's ringing. Hey, Mom, it's me. You and Dad get to Grandma's ranch as soon as possible. I'll explain it when you get here. All right, bye. Okay, let's go downstairs. Bring your phone. Lizzie, just stop. You've got to tell me what is going on in that brain of yours. Call every person that you know and call in every favor that you can. What for? We're going to turn the ranch into a Christmas market. A Christmas market? Yes. Call all the farms that you saved and have them bring vegetables, fruits, food, drinks, crafts, anything and everything. What if they can't? You saved them, Grandma, and now you need their help. They owe you. A Christmas market? Yes. We'll have the tables all set up in the barn with the merchandise. We'll have Christmas music playing and hopefully it'll be one of the attractions. I don't think something like that'll work. Trust me, Grandma, it will. You really believe it? I do. Now get calling. We need as much help as we can get. Everybody? Yes. Okay, I don't need you over my shoulder. Go. Okay. Lizzie. Are you all right? You guys came. We kept trying to call you back, but you didn't pick up, and your grandmother's not answering. What's going on? Are you okay? I'm sorry, my phone was off. And then out of the blue, you tell us to get here as quickly as you can? You've got us really worried, Lizzie. I'm gonna save Grandma's ranch. Save it? Did you guys know Grandma was in a lot of debt? Yeah, well, you shouldn't know that. Well, we need to raise $3,500, or else the bank's gonna take the ranch from her. Lizzie, where's your grandmother? She's in the house, probably making phone calls. All right, I, I, I've got to go talk to her. I just need you guys to help me out here. What do you need? I have some more of these tables in the back of the house, so we just need to bring them out here to the barn and set them up. But we need to move fast. OK, come on, let's go. OK, Charlie, that's great. Thank you. All right, I'll see you tomorrow then, bright and early. OK. Merry Christmas. What's going on, Mom? Are you really in that much trouble? Apparently I am. 
A lady from the bank came by and has given me until Christmas Eve to come up with a very inflated loan payment. You should have asked me if you needed help. I don't want you to lose this place. David, you and Susan have enough problems of your own. I wasn't going to burden you with this, too. Besides, all things happen for a reason. There's got to be something we can do. Lizzie's doing something. What's she do now? Apparently, she's saving the ranch. Mom, she's a 16-year-old girl. How's she going to be able to do that? She's smart. And she's very creative. <laughs> and so determined. I'm listening to her. Now go. I've got things to do. Um, all right, but what do you need me to do? Go see Lizzie. I'm sure she's got a list for you, too. She's in charge? Yes. She's in charge. She wants to be trusted with this. Do you? Do you trust her? She really cares about this place. Give her a chance to show it. Rhoda. Hi, it's Mary. Listen, something has come up and well, I've got a big favor to ask you. I'd really like it if you and Dad would stay for market tomorrow. Lizzie, we have to work. Figures. I'll call into the office and we have to ask your grandma if it's okay. She won't mind. You really think this is gonna work? Yeah. It's gonna be a beautiful market, Mom. What are we selling? Whatever people bring us. Things should be coming in any minute now. <laughs> well, what else do we have to do to set up for tomorrow? I can't think of anything right now, so I think we're good. But I'll let you know if anything comes up. Okay, sounds great. Oh my goodness. That's beautiful. Hey, hi, Mary. Oh, oh you're gorgeous. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Lizzie. Hi. Thank you. All of this is from the McDougals. Part of that money from the loan is save their ranch. And it's all a gift. That's so amazing. I know. Well, where do we put him? Oh, that's the boss. Hey, Mom, Dad, can you come help us put some of these over there? We're going to be selling them right tomorrow morning. Mm -hmm. Are they going to be okay overnight? Yeah, they should be fine. The barn gets really cold at night, so they'll be good, especially since How we're selling them. How do you know that? I mean, he stayed there overnight. You let Lizzie sleep in the barn? I may have. How come you wouldn't when I was a kid? He's pretty special. Thanks for coming back. Yeah, Mary asked me to. She did? Yeah.
Y mire, si usted lo trae, nosotros se lo evaluamos y le decimos cuál es la diferencia que le queda con el cero kilómetro. En 15 minutos nosotros le resolvemos todo. ¿Lo espero entonces? Perfecto, señor Galeano. Buenísimo. ¿Cuánto demorará en llegar? Perfecto. Lo espero entonces, señor Galeano. Hasta luego. Sí, sí, pregunte por Pablo que lo voy a estar esperando. Adiós. ¿Y? ¿Se lo lleva entonces? Es un autazo, ¿eh? Sí, sí. Me costó tomar la decisión, ¿eh? Es el primer auto a cero kilómetro que me compré. ¡Ey! ¡Enhorabuena! Bueno, venga que filmamos los papeles. Casi que, que no duermo anoche. No le voy a negar, estoy un poco, un poco nervioso. Pero, pero poder pagarlo. Sí, bueno, no se preocupe. Las cuotas son la única forma de poder comprarse algo. Hugo, ¿se siente bien? Estoy bien. Estoy bien. Me falta, me falta el aire nomás, es eso. Hugo. Hugo. Hugo, llama a una ambulancia. Hugo, llama a una ambulancia, dale, che. Oh. Bueno, posiblemente es un infarto, va a haber que trasladarlo y alguien tiene que acompañarlo. Oh, amigo. Bueno, voy yo. No me puedo morir. Mis hijos son chicos todavía. ¿Y quién te dijo que te ibas a morir? Tranquilo, tené paz. Hola Mario, ¿cómo te van? Ay, ¿pudiste atender a Galeano? ¿Te firmó los papeles? Sí, 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 le presenté el mejor plan, le descrejé todas las dudas y cerramos la venta. Qué bueno Mario, te agradezco un montón. Gracias viejo, hoy tuve el garrón de la ambulancia. Eh, ¿Dónde dejaste la venta? Eh, la pasé a gerencia. ¿Cómo que ya la pasaste? Esa venta era mía, Mario. Galeano era mi cliente. Sí, habrá sido cliente tuyo, pero lo tuve que atender yo y en mi horario de descanso. Este, mira, no me pidas que te regale una venta. Pero la venta ya estaba cerrada, Mario. La arreglé por teléfono. Eh, perdóname, pero el que llenó los papeles, que le hizo firmar todo, fui yo. Y la verdad... A mí tampoco los números me cierran, ¿me entendés? Porque si vamos al caso, vos tendrías que haber estado acá y no paseando por ahí. ¿Paseando? No podés. Ezequiel, 
¿Me traes un tostado, por favor? Pablo. Horacio. ¿Cómo te va? Bien. ¿Qué decís? Tantos años. ¿Siempre comes acá? ¿Qué te pasa? ¿Anda más del hígado que comes eso? <risa> ¿No me vas a pedir un café después de tanto tiempo? ¿eh? Ese, ¿me anotas un café? ¿Qué haces afuera de la iglesia, pastor? ¿Estás de vacaciones? No, eh, vengo porque justamente te estoy buscando vos. Esta oportunidad, Pablo. Siempre quisiste pastorear una iglesia desde el seminario. No te tuve ganas de servir. Y era claro que tenías un llamado. Y esta iglesia es justo para vos. Chiquita, en un pueblo tranquilo. La gente necesita un pastor joven que haga cosas nuevas. Y vos podés dejar este trabajo que te mantiene lejos de tus sueños. Sí, pero por lo menos me mantiene. A dura pena llego a fin de mes. No, no tengo restos para emprender algo así. No tengo ahorros, ¿me entendés? Mira, a decir verdad, yo me tenía que hacer cargo de esta iglesia. Pero vos sabés que con la que tengo acá, yo ya no doy abasto. Y pensé en vos. Siempre quisiste esto, Pablo. Y no tengas miedo, ¿no? Te voy a dejar solo. Mensualmente te vamos a enviar un giro para que vos tengas para tus gastos y para que eh, se asiente la situación allá hasta que todo arranque. Tema cerrado, Pablo. Acá tenés las llaves. Te están esperando. Mozo, la cuenta, por favor. Hola, mi amor. Hola, llegaste. Sí. Te esperaba más temprano. ¿Cómo te fue con Galeano? ¿Cerraste la venta? No, me la fanó más, dijo. Pero como no era cliente tuyo. Sí, bien dijiste, era. Bueno, no te preocupes, ya llegará otro. Seguro el que te llamó ayer te compra uno. Sí, hoy fui a la agencia. Bueno, ¿viste? No tenés de qué preocuparte, sos bueno en lo tuyo. ¿Y? ¿Se fue contento? No, se descompuso. ¿Con un auto cero kilómetros se descompone? No, el auto no. Hugo, y encima lo tuve que llevar en ambulancia al hospital. No sabés qué día. ¿Al hospital? ¿Y de qué te reís? ¿Lo viste loco? Para, para, para. Tengo una notición para contarte. Pará. No, pará. Pará. Tengo, tengo peor. Pará. Tengo una pila de ropa. Dame cinco minutos. Te, te traje un chocolate. De esos que te gustan. No te la vas a comer. ¿Qué me vas a pedir? Tengo una noticia. Okay. Una notición. Es lo que siempre estuvimos esperando. Ay, bueno, pará, no me asuste. Dale, contame. No, 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 no mejor no. No, no me cuentes, no quiero saber. No. Bueno, dale. ¿Es del trabajo? Sí, creo que sí. Se me dio Laura, por fin se me dio. Hoy me vino a visitar el pastor Horacio. Y no sabes el notición que me dio. Vamos, felicite a su esposo, el pastor Pablo Ferrer. Ay, Pablo, pensé que era algo importante. Padre pa Laura, ¿Está ¿me podés escuchar? ¿Está bien? La iglesia de Manzanares necesitaba un pastor. Sí, Laura, Manzanares. Y bueno, pensaron en mí. Manzanares. ¿Dónde queda Manzanares? Un pueblito en la provincia de Buenos Aires, Laura. Para, pero. ¿Hay que mudarse? Sí. A ver. Vos te apareces. Así. Me traes un chocolate. Me decís que tenemos que irnos. Que tenemos que mudarnos, dejar nuestra casa, irnos no sé dónde, hacer no sé qué cosas. 
¿Vos te estás escuchando? Y pero Laura no era lo que habíamos pensado para nuestra familia. ¿Qué tiene que ver eso? Y sí, Laura, a ver, el pasto verde, el sol, el campo. No es, no es lo que habíamos soñado para no. criar a nuestro hijo, que pueda correr, que pueda jugar, que pueda saltar. No que esté acá metido entre el cemento, la calle, los autos. La locura. ¿Me escuchás? No sé. Me da miedo. ¿Cuándo sería? Y tenemos unos días para irnos y acomodamos las cosas y nos vamos. ¿Unos días? ¿Vos te volviste loco? Pero, Laura, confía. Tenemos que confiar. No, 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 no. Y no. Olvídate. Evangélica de San Pueblo. Sí, para allá. Ah. Justo estábamos esperando al nuevo pastor que viene de Buenos Aires. Sí, soy yo, Pablo. ¿Pastor? Disculpe, es que se lo ve tan joven. ¿Cuántos años tiene? Laura, Laura, mi hermosa. Hola, ¿qué tal? Mucho gusto. Encantada. Bueno, eh, si quieren nos acompañamos hasta la parada. Sí, por favor. Le hago una pregunta. Sí. ¿Hace mucho que están sin pastor? Y casi un año. Desde sí, que, no. que murió el pastor Dávalo. Un hombre de Dios. Una sabiduría, una seriedad. Llegó a los 86 años y no faltó un domingo. La gente lo quería mucho. Y sí, va a ser muy difícil reemplazarlo. Muy difícil. De hecho, antes que usted vino otro pastor, Domínguez. No sé si lo conoce. No, no lo conocemos. Se tuvo que ir, no se adaptó. Ahí viene el colectivo. Bueno, entonces nos vemos el domingo a las 8. ¿A las 8? Sí, sí, a casa sí, a las 8. Va a tener que ir a avisar casa por casa porque hace mucho que no funciona la iglesia. Y bueno, a la gente no se junta. Cacho, ¿podés alcanzar a la iglesia? Es el nuevo pastor. Nos vemos el domingo. A las 8. Un lugar más lejos no había, ¿no? Bueno, Laura, son seis cuadras nada más. Mirá lo hermoso que es. Uf, hermoso.
No, todo bien. Estaba haciendo un poco de limpieza. Esto está muy poco habitable. Estamos matando unas ratas y... ¿Ratas? No, no, no. Yo... Vos no pensarás que yo voy a vivir acá. ¿no? Pará, la... La... Laura. 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 Esperen, esperen, esperen. Por favor, esperen. No se apresuren. Tengo algo para mostrarle. Señora, por favor, ¿me sigue? Por favor. Gracias. Pase, por favor. Bueno, esto es lo mejor que pude hacer con lo que encontré, con lo que había. Espero les guste. Por acá, por favor. Por acá. Esta es la cama que dejó el pastor. Sí. El pastor que se fue. Uy, bueno, Laura, pará. Pará un poco. Eh, perdón. Eh, yo me tengo que ir. No, me están pero, esperando. ¿Cómo, cómo que se va a ir? ¿Sí? ¿No tiene que terminar de arreglar las cosas? Sí, pero, perdón, perdón. Pero eso lo voy a hacer en los ratos libres. Entre trabajo y trabajo. Ahora me tengo que retirar. Bueno, lo acompaño. Está fuera, Laura. ¿Me esperas? Por favor. Discúlpeme, me puse nervioso, vio cómo estaba mi esposa. Pablo, yo sé entender. No hay problema, todo tiene solución. Bueno, Para eso estoy. Muchas gracias. Por favor. Si me espera un par de días, voy a poder pagarle. Dígame, dígame cuánto es. Lo mío es gratis. No cobro. Solo lo hago porque me gusta, pero los materiales los compra usted, ¿eh? Mire, hay que arreglar la cocina, un par de bancos rotos fumigar y algunas otras cosas. Bueno, el domingo pediré una donación en la iglesia y, y se lo pagaremos. Pastor, a esta gente, más que pedir hay que darle. Pero no se preocupe, yo cobré un trabajito y yo voy comprando las cosas. Después me lo paga. Bueno, muchísimas gracias, pero dígame su nombre. Don Salvi. Bueno, don Salvi, muchísimas gracias. Yo esperaba otra cosa. Confía, mi amor. Confía que... Todo va a mejorar.
bueno, pastor. Gracias, igualmente. Nos lo, vemos el domingo. Lo espero, lo espero. Bendiciones. Hermanas. Dios lo bendiga, pastor. Gracias, muchas gracias. gracias Nos vemos, gracias. gracias. Ay, pastor, no se ponga mal. Es que va a ser muy difícil reemplazar a Don Dávalos. Él era todo para la gente. Acá todo el mundo lo respetaba. Y a usted se lo ve tan joven. Tenga paciencia. Me voy a poner el agua para los fideos. Bueno, pastor, ¿cómo anda? Acá traje las maderas, las de los bancos, la puerta. Gracias, don Salvi, pero me parece no va a ser necesario. Ah, bueno. No empezamos bien, ¿no? No, parece que no. ¿Le puedo hacer una pregunta? Dígame, ¿por qué vino este pueblito perdido? ¿Por qué es mi vocación? Siempre quise serle útil a las personas y serle útil a él. ¿Y estudió para esto? Sí, unos años en el seminario. Pero desde chico que soñó con ser parte de una iglesia, con servirle a Dios. Sáqueme de una duda. De los libros que leyó. ¿Alguno decía que iba a ser fácil? Cuando yo arreglo un techo o una puerta y me voy, la gente no ve todo lo que hice. Ve el trabajo terminado. ¿Les gusta o no? Y por ahí hasta les parece caro. Ellos no saben todo lo que tuve que hacer. Solo esperan resultados. El paso a paso es un problema mío. <ríe> y tienen que quedar satisfechos. Pablo, preocúpese por su trabajo. Me parece demasiado pronto para ver frutos. Sí. Tiene razón, don Salvi. Gracias. ¿Sabe qué? Mire. Doña Elvira andaba vendiendo unas flores para poderse comprar algo para comer. Tenga. Tenga. Llévele a su esposa. Seguro que a ella le van a gustar. Sí, te ocupes eso. Eh. Eh, Martita, ¿cuándo vas a venir al río conmigo? Eh, saludame, eh. La cena interesante. Mira el bombocito que te está perdiendo. Eh, pero algo.
Eh, qué buena que está la bici, eh. A ver. ¿Qué pasa? ¿Me la vas a negar? ¿Te pones en ortiva? Hace mucho que no pedaleo, eh. Está buena esta. Sí, salame. Dejá de la bici al pibe. ¿Qué querés? Te dije que le dejé la bici al pibe. Toma. Tranquilo, Tranquilo pibe. Toma. Lo tuyo es tuyo, lo mío es mío. ¿Trajiste lo mío? Pará, tranquilo. No te vio nadie, ¿no? ¿Seguro? No le dijiste a nadie, ¿no? Toma pala. No vas a hacer buchón como tu hermano, ¿no? Callate, te dije, que lo dejé tranquilo el pibe. ¿Vos sabés qué? Hasta vos tenés pinta de ser más inteligente que tu hermano. Mirá, si sos calladito mientras tu hermano está en cana, Puedes hacer unos billetes para ayudar a tu vieja, ¿viste? Mirá, si tu hermano hubiese dado la guita a la cana, estaríamos todos de lujo ahora. Pero el mulji se dejó atrapar. Y de flojito nomás el maricón. Te dije que lo dejé tranquilo, pala. Este no es ningún flojo, mirá. Este va a sacar a la familia adelante. Tengo un trabajito para vos. Difícil. Pero seguro que para vos no es tan difícil. Tenés que ir a la terminal a buscar un paquete. ¿Un paquete? Ah, no, pibe. ¿Cómo me equivoqué con vos? Pensé que ya estaba, pero te falta, ¿eh? No, deja, deja. No, 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 no. Yo puedo. ¿Seguro? Sí. Así me gusta. Bueno, venite el martes que arreglamos todo. Toma. Pero chito la boca, ¿eh? ¿Entendiste? ¿Lo va a mandar de carnada? A ver si pican. ¿Y si lo agarran y habla? ¿Con el hermano en cana? Lo entierra más si habla. Además, yo no lo conozco, ¿y vos? No sé qué te pasa ni por qué estás llorando. ¿Cómo te llamas? Marta. Bienvenida, Marta. ¿Qué te está pasando? ¿Te puedo ayudar en algo? Marta, yo sé que hay razones que nos llevan a callar, a escondernos. Y muchas veces esas razones son dolorosas. Pero vos viniste a buscar la ayuda de alguien inmensamente superior a mí. Alguien que prometió hacernos libres y que quiere darnos paz. Una paz que solamente Él nos puede dar. Ven, vamos a sentarnos. Este tipo, este tipo abusó de mí hace 10 años. Era una nena. 
Me arruinó la vida. Es una basura, me arruinó la vida. Yo sé que no es fácil. Pero lo mejor que podés hacer es perdonarlo. ¿Perdonarlo? ¡Nunca! ¡Debería estar muerto! ¡Debería pagar por años lo que me hizo! ¡Me arruinó la vida y usted quiere que lo perdone! ¡Esa es la ayuda que su Dios me quiere dar! ¿Perdonar a quién? ¿A un violador? No, Marta, no es lo que querés. Cuanto menos resentimiento guarde, más liviana va a ser tu carga y más fácil va a ser la salida, Marta. Libera tu alma con el perdón. Y encima lo reciben como un héroe, el gran deportista. ¿Quién me va a creer? ¿Quién me va a creer? Yo ¡Nadie! Te... ¡Nadie me va a creer! Yo te creo. ¿Y qué va a hacer? ¡Lo va a perdonar! Una cosa es perdonarlo y otra cosa es que pague por lo que hizo. Mañana vamos a la policía. ¿Y otra vez contar todo? ¿Diez años después? ¿Otra vez que no pase nada? No, yo no, ¿sabe? Yo no. ¿Sabe qué? A de punta como que no le dije nada. Nunca le dije nada. Marta, me gustaría que puedas calmarte. Y que juntos encontremos una solución a todo esto. Confía en Dios. ¿Confía en Dios? Hace 10 años que me arrastro por esta inmundicia de pueblo. ¿Y sabe qué? No le importo a nadie. Si mañana me muriera tampoco le importaría a nadie. Usted, señora, tiene cara de inteligente. Haga mi caso. Y váyanse, antes que la basura los tape. Alguien tiene que quemar este pueblo. Ahí está. Pídale a su Dios que queme este pueblo. No, mejor deje. Lo quemo yo. Deje. Mejor lo quemo yo a este pueblo. Marta. Marta. Pobre, está tan mal. Sí, se nota. No, si vos supieras la historia que tiene, pobrecita, no puede ni pensar. Bueno, igual... En algo tiene razón. Basura sobra, me la paso sacando basura. Laura, no empieces. Ay, decime, Pablo, ¿dónde me trajiste? Yo entiendo tu amor por Dios, tu amor por el servicio. Pero yo... Ay, Laura, no es el momento. ¿Y cuándo es el momento? Fui a buscar al médico del pueblo. Hice una cola de tres horas. Me mandó a 12 kilómetros a un hospital. Un hospital, bueno. Vos tenés que ver lo que es eso. El ginecólogo... Cada 15 días viene, cada 15. ¿Vos entendés lo que es eso? Si pasa una urgencia, ¿qué hacemos? No sé, Laura, ya lo voy a solucionar. Dame unos días. ¿Qué? ¿Me vas a fabricar un consultorio? Pablo, mi amor, lo intentaste. Dios sabe que lo intentaste. Pero en este lugar no hay nada para hacer un tratamiento. Y el bebé no llega. A la gente no le importa, a la gente no te quiere, no le interesa la iglesia. Por más que le ponga ganas y confianza, no sirve de nada. Va a pasar, Laura. Va a pasar con un poco de fe. ¡Ay, Pablo! Con fe no se come. Mañana tengo que ir al mercado y no tenemos nada. No, no sé. Mañana le llamo a Horacio y algo me va a mandar. Hace 10 días que no te da bolilla y seguís creyendo que Horacio te va a ayudar. Despertate. Te mintieron, te engañaron. Te dejaron un clavo remachado que no tiene arreglo. ¡Basta! Por favor, volvamos a casa. Laura. No puede ser, es lo que esperé toda mi vida. Ay, sos, no me puede fallar. Sos un egoísta. Lo único que te importa es la iglesia. Ay, iglesia. ¿Por qué no escuchas un poquito a Marta? Ella sí conoce este lugar. Y yo pienso irme antes de que me tape la basura. Laura, dame unos días. Vas a ver cómo todo se va a solucionar. Sí, sí, sí. Ya sé. Confía. Gracias, Marisa, por haberme acompañado al hospital. Pero por favor, para mí fue un gusto haberlo escuchado orar por ese abuelo. Mm. Es más, me encantó. Bueno, me alegro. Al final hay que reconocer que usted es una persona especial. ¿Qué? ¿Pero qué dice, Marisa? Allá está María. Ella quería hablar con usted, Pastor. ¿Sí? ¿Cómo Pastor, no? Hola. yo... Eh... Disculpe. Pastor, necesito hablar con usted. Es urgente. Sí, bueno. Dígame, ¿en qué puedo ayudarla? 
La historia es larga, pastor. Don Salvi la conoce. Tengo un hijo preso. Y el más chico le está siguiendo los pasos, se está metiendo en líos, no escucha consejos. Eh, necesito que alguien me ayude. Bueno, señora, yo no. Pero, pero Dios sí. Cuénteme y, y vemos qué podemos hacer. ¿Cómo va, don Salvi? ¡Qué bueno! ¿Pudo arreglar la cerradura? En eso estábamos, ya casi está lista. Le faltan los tornillos, pero ya está lista. ¡Ah! Le conseguí la canilla para el lavatorio. Es usada, pero está de 10. Oh, gracias, Salvi. ¿Qué haría yo sin usted? Y no podría abrir la puerta ni lavarse la cara. <risa> Salvi. Sí. Recién estuve hablando con una señora que dice que tiene el hijo preso. Dice que usted lo conoce. Ah, Juan. Es un problema, es una larga historia. Sí, algo me contó. Qué mm. difícil debe ser para la viuda, ¿no? Imagínese, el mayor preso, el menor que está haciendo negocios con el tranza del pueblo, está desesperada. ¿Y qué me dice de los hermanitos delincuentes? Cosas de la vida. El preso era buen pibe, ¿eh? Es más, venía a la iglesia hasta los 17, 18 años, más o menos. ¿Y qué? ¿Se fue? Falleció el padre. Se enojó con el mundo, con Dios. Se pasó de bando. Empezó rateando. Pero dicen que últimamente había saltado una financiera y había hecho buena plata. Eso dice. Si tuviera la plata, el hermanito no andaría dando vuelta en esos negocios. Para el pibe, el hermano es un ídolo. Está fascinado. Y que le tengan miedo en el pueblo. ¿Y en qué cárcel está? ¿Cárcel? No, no. Está en la comisaría del pueblo. A ver, cuando consigan un lugar seguramente lo van a trasladar o... o lo van a soltar hasta el juicio, ¿vio? ¿Sabe? Me parece... Parece que tendría que ir a visitarlo, ¿no? ¡Muy buena idea, pastor! Sí, sí vaya. Le va a ser bien. Sabe, eh, en este tiempo no abunda mucho eso de poner la oreja y la gente lo necesita. ¿Mm? Eh, bueno, esto ya está casi listo. Le pongo la manija y voy por la canilla. Gracias, Salvi. Le debo una. Pastor, en este banco siempre va a tener crédito. En el del pueblo, no creo. ¿eh? Bueno, ya está. Gracias por recibirme. ¿Y cómo no? No hay mucha visita por acá últimamente. ¿Así que usted es el pastor? ¿No parece? Sí, ya sé. Demasiado joven. No sé, puede ser. ¿Qué vino? ¿Predicarle al diablo? <risa> no, no, no. Ya me dijeron que vos sabés de esas cosas. Vos después ibas a la iglesia. Es verdad. En un tiempo, cuando era un poco blando. Después entendí que nadie te regala nada. Que si querés algo te lo tenés que ganar. ¿Ganártelo o robártelo? ¿Es lo mismo? Es lo mismo, pastor. Todos roban. Los políticos roban, los comerciantes roban. ¿Por qué yo no? Es mi trabajo. ¿Cuál es el problema? ¿Usted no roba acaso? ¿No le roba las armas al diablo? <risa> Yo no vine a robarte nada. ¿Y a qué vino entonces? 
Ya le dije la de borrar. Y no sé dónde está la plata. Así que pierda las esperanzas, pastor. Mira, no sé de qué estás hablando. A mí me mandó tu vieja. ¿La vieja? ¿Cómo va la vieja? ¿Qué sé? Por acá no aparece, ¿sabes? Anda enojada conmigo. Pero bueno, es entendible. Igual hace bien en ir a llorar a la iglesia. Por más que llore, igual el viejo ya no vuelve, ¿sabes? Tu papá. Lo extrañas. Eh, papá, está tranquilo. Qué lindo tratar de confesar el tema. No, 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 perdón. Pensé que por ahí querías hablar del tema. Según tu mamá, era un buen hombre. Mi viejo era el mejor. Pastor. Inteligente, laburador. Un señor. El mejor albañil. Lejos. Lo venían a buscar de todos lados, ¿sabes? Siempre laburando y laburando. Y cuando no laburaba, se quedaba en casa. Con la vieja, en el patio, y las plantas, y su parra. Le gustaba ver cómo, cómo daban los racimos la parra, ¿sabes? Me gustaba ver el fruto. Se reía tanto. Pero se enfermó, ¿sabes? Los pulmones, dijo el topo. Al principio bien. Después fueron los acabando los ahorros y... al último... yo era pibe ningún laburo al final no los compraba ni los quería tomar después se lo mandaban de la iglesia, ¿sabes? Un día que fui a buscar los remedios a la iglesia, hablé con Dios, ¿sabes? Le dije que si lo salvaba yo me quedaba. Yo me iba a quedar en la iglesia para servirle, para siempre. Pero al tiempo murió. Y me fui, ¿sabes? Me fui. Estaba enojado con Dios, ¿sabes? Sentí que me había fallado. Sí. Y me fui. Me fui de acá para allá. Hasta que. Hasta que conseguí este laburito. Que si lo hubiera conseguido antes, le hubiera comprado los remedios y chao. Es difícil. A mí no me pasó. Pero vos pensás que si tu hijo hubiera sabido de dónde salía la guita, ¿la hubiera aceptado? Sí. Y yo iba a ser tan estúpido de... de decirle el afane. Le compraba los remedios y chao, pastor. ¿Sabe que mientras cortaba a la parra, yo le llevaba mate? Y él me hablaba de la Biblia, de la parra y qué sé yo. Me decía el 15. ¿El 15? Sí. Decía que me puso Juan por Juan 15. Claro, mirá vos. En Juan 15 la Biblia habla sobre la parra. De eso te estaría hablando tu viejo. ¿Cómo está la vieja, pastor? Cuéntame. Preocupada. Por tu hermano. ¿Con el Mati? ¿Qué le pasa a Mati? Nada. No está yendo a la escuela. Se está juntando con tus amigos. ¿Con quién? Ramón y la bandita. No, pastor. No, pastor. 
No se puede meter con Ramón. Es una serpiente, ¿se entiende? Tiene que sacarlo de ahí usted, pastor. Ya hablé con él, pero Ramón le anda diciendo que va a ser mejor que vos. ¿Ves? Que más vivo que vos. ¿Ves lo que le digo? ¿Eh? Es una basura, es, es una serpiente. Y se va a querer vengar de mí con el mate. ¿Vengar? ¿Pero cómo? ¿No son socios ustedes? Sí, es largo, pastor. Bueno. Ayer, después de hablar con Mati, pasó tu hija por la iglesia. Dice que ayer no volvió. Que Ramón, que fue lo de Ramón y, y no volvió a dormir. Tiene que sacarlo del pastor. Tiene que sacarlo, pastor. Escúcheme, tiene que sacarlo. Esa rata es capaz de matarlo, ¿me entiende? Pero qué pibe es. Eh? ¿Por qué no me preguntó? Él te admira, Juan. Quiere ser como vos, ¿eh? ¿Como yo? ¿Pero qué tiene en la cabeza el estúpido ese? ¿Qué es lo que admira de mí el salame? Como el viejo tendría que ser. Ese era un hombre. Al viejo debería admirar. Pero... Pero el mate era chico. Claro, yo me fui... Eh, eh, yo hice la mía... Pero no importa, pastor. No importa, esta vez lo voy a salvar. Esta vez lo salvo yo al Mati. Con el viejo no pude, ¿sabes? Pero esta vez al Mati lo salvo yo. Hágame un favor, pastor. Consígame un par de sobres. Dele estos dos sobres a Ramón y lleve al Mati a casa. Hágame ese favor. Escúcheme, dele este sobre a Ramón. Míreme, pastor. Y asegúrese de que le dé al Mati. Después que le da al Mati, que el Mati está con usted, dele este segundo sobre. Él ya va a saber. Asegúrese de que el Mati esté con usted. Prométamelo, pastor. Prométamelo. Sí, Juan. Te lo prometo. Pero mira, toma. Lee. ¿Lee el cielo, pastor? Sí. Eso es Juan 15. Seguro eso te leía tu viejo. Léelo y después me contás.
mejor que puedes hacer es perdonar. Libera a tu alma con el perdón. ¿Qué es esto, Marta? Lo que la avisamos, oficial. Son para las pruebas de ADN de Mario Peralta. No. Esto, querida, esto no sirve para nada. ¿Cómo para que no nada? sirve? ¿Sabe lo que me costó conseguirlo? ¿Lo que esperé para tener esto? Por eso mismo, Marta. No compliquemos más las cosas. Y no quiero saber dónde conseguiste esto, ¿me entendiste? No sea cosa que te tenga que dejar arrestada por algún ilícito. ¿Arrestada yo? Sí. Marta, cálmate un poquito. Tranquila. Oficial, acá algo no está bien. Ella acusa y reconoce directamente a Peralta. Con un sencillo ADN se comprueba que es él y se terminó la discusión. Mire, pastor, no es tan sencillo. Hay ciertos procedimientos de la justicia que hay que respetar. Ah, bueno. Espera, te dije. ¿Qué procedimientos son esos? Mire, en aquel momento se hicieron los estudios pertinentes a todos los masculinos ligados con tu causa. Pero no se encontró, no, ninguno coincidió con, con el ADN de las manchas en el vestido. Sí, pero la familia dice que él al día siguiente se fue para Buenos Aires. Él no estaba entre los que convocaron para las muestras. Y claro, como él era famoso, no le iban a molestar, ¿verdad? Lo que pasa es que nadie pensó que él... ¡Pero fue él! Oficial, no la haga más difícil. Usted algo tiene que hacer. Por favor, podría ser su hija. De hecho, hasta hace algunos años jugaban juntas en el colegio. A ver. Hazme un favor. Firmame aquí. Esto es un expediente para reactivar el caso que está todavía está archivado. Y yo me voy a ocupar. Me voy a mover para que el juez pida un ADN de curso legal. Cosa que no fue hecho en su momento. Y vos te vas a tu casa. Te quedás tranquila. No hagas locuras. Y no le contés a nadie. ¿Dónde conseguiste esto? Ni cómo. ¿Me entendiste? A nadie. ¿Está claro? Gracias, oficial. Confiamos en que se resuelve pronto. Uh -huh. Va a ser más pronto de lo que usted cree. Háganos saber de los resultados. Uh -huh. Bien. ¿Qué va a hacer, Martita? Uh -huh. Tantos años de demora. A veces el diablo mete la cola, ¿no es cierto, pastor? Si a usted eso lo hace sentir mejor, échele la culpa a él. Total, es lo que suelen hacer todos. Bueno, voy a llevar el expediente para enviarlo lo más rápido posible a Central. ¿Mm? Con permiso.
¿Cómo te sentís? Rara. Pero ¿sabe qué? Tenía razón, Pablo. Es como si me hubiera sacado una mochila enorme de encima. Es como si pudiera al fin respirar. Anda a tu casa y descansa. Luego más tarde la iglesia. Ah, pastor. Eh, Juan después quiere hablar con usted. Bueno, un momento, por favor. con Marta. Salió todo bastante bien. Qué bueno, yo estoy acá con el almuerzo. Te espero a almorzar, ¿sí? Mi amor, tengo un tema que resolver y voy, ¿sí? Nosotros también tenemos temas para resolver, Pablo. ¿Puedes venir a comer? Hago todo lo posible, Laura. Una hora más o menos, ¿sí? Te quiero. Después hablamos. Sí, después. Después. ¿Qué pasa, Juan? Mi pastor, ¿averiguó lo de Mati? No, justo, justo pensaba en ir a buscarlo. ¿Pero cómo pensaba, pastor? No, pastor, no se duerma, pastor, no se duerma. Usted es el único que puede ir. Yo no puedo salir, pero usted puede llegar. Es urgente, pastor. De pronto, todo es urgente, Juan. Todo. ¿Para eso me mandaste a llamar? No. No. Quería... Quería decirle que... Que tenía razón, pastor. Con lo de Juan 15. De esto me hablaba mi viejo. Es más, cuando leía, me acordaba de su voz. Qué grande el viejo. Por lo visto, no solo podaba. También estaba sembrando en tu corazón. ¿Se acuerda? Usted me preguntó qué diría mi viejo si me viera acá. Y seguramente no le gustaría. No le hubiera gustado. Le hubiera gustado verme así. A él le hubiera gustado verme como dice. Como dice ahí. Como dice ahí. Eh, Permanecer, pastor. Permanecer en él. Había hecho un... Había hecho un blando. No puedo... No puedo parar de llorar. Usted sabe... Usted sabe cómo hacer. ¿Cómo hacer qué? Para pedir perdón, para... Para... Permanecer. Vamos a ver. Señor, guarda a mi hermano. Cuidalo, Señor, y bendecilo. Bendecí su familia, ¿Qué pasa, Pablo? ¿Estás nervioso? Oh, sí, la verdad que un poco sí. Salvi, ¿cómo, ¿cómo llegué hasta acá? En la camioneta, Pablo. ¿Tienen las cartas? Sí, pero, pero no sé. No sé qué, Pablo. No sé cuál va primero y cuál va después. Pero, Pablo, a ver, deme, ¿no tiene una marca, un número? No, no tiene nada. ¿Qué hago? Esto es así. Esta va primero y esta va después. ¿Entendió? ¿Seguro? Seguro, Pablo. Vaya, por favor. ¿Me espera, por favor? Sí, sí, no me voy. Bueno. Ah. 
Ramón, es el pastor. Mi mamá lo mandó. Ella lo conoce. Buenas tardes. Hola, Mati. ¿El señor Ramón? El señor está en el cielo, dicen, ¿no? Me mandó Juan, vengo por un negocio. ¿Y quién es el que se mete con los negocios que tengo con Juan? Mira, no tengo idea de los negocios que tienen entre ustedes. Yo solo vine por el Mati. ¿El Mati? El Mati no se va a ningún lado. ¿Quién dijo que se va al Mati? ¿Vos te creí, pibe? No, no, yo me quedo. Mati, me manda a tu mamá a buscarte. <risa> te busca tu mami, Mati. Anda. Y, y, y me manda Juan que te necesita. Tu hermano Juan te necesita. Juan. Juan me necesita. Shh, pará, mocoso, pará. Mira. Juan. Sí, Juan está preso. Mira. Al pibe lo estoy cuidando yo. Mira. Hasta que salga, creo que va a salir pronto. Pero al pibe lo estoy cuidando yo. Mira, él me dio esta carta y me dijo que, que vos ibas a entender. Carta de Juan, pala. Qué pedazo de turre, Juan, eh. Se quedó con la plata. Nos mintió. Nos vino con el cuento de que se la había dado a la policía. Pastor. Acá dice que vos tenés un plano para darnos. Sí, mirá, no, no, no sabía que era un plano, pero sí, lo tengo yo. Se la saco a patadas. Tranquilo. Es un enviado de Dios. Mirá, yo no sé nada de un mapa, yo solo quiero al Mati. ¿eh? Lo tengo yo. Usted es pastor, ¿no? Dice la verdad, ¿no? Porque si no se lo lleva al diablo. <risa> ¿Quién dice, jefe, que no lo desnudo y se la saco ahora? Mira, a vos no te conviene, no te conviene perder tiempo. Lo dejá ir al Mati para la camioneta y yo me voy. Mati, anda a la camioneta. Pará, ¿qué camioneta? ¿Qué hacemos, Ramón? Saben todo. No pasa nada, Pablo. Pero nos mintió, Ramón. Juan nos mintió. Anda a buscar la guita. Algo tenemos que hacer, ¿eh? Algo hay que hacer. Ya me la van a pagar. Ya me la van a pagar. ¿Pasó el susto? No sé si pasó, no sé si pasó. Bueno, si no les parece mal, yo te dejo en la casa de tu mamá porque tengo que ir al centro a buscar un par de regalos. No, no, yo quiero ir a ver a Juan. Pa pará, primero vamos, pasamos por lo de tu mamá y después si querés vamos a verlo a Juan caminando. Y todos felices. Dijo, ¿regalos? Don Salvi, ¿qué estamos, de fiesta? Juan, te vas. Quédate afuera hasta el juicio. ¿Mm? Bien, igual mucho más, no me pensaba quedar. Bien, eh, andá y cuídate, mira que están preguntando por vos afuera.
Me imagino que el lunes volvés a la escuela, Mati, ¿no? Disculpe. Hola. Sí, es la familia Rodríguez. ¿Cómo? No puede ser. No puede ser, es del hospital. Le dispararon a Juan, hay que ir. Ese fue Ramón. Ese fue Ramón. Lleva la vieja, pastor. Lleva la vieja, pastor. Vamos. Acompáñeme, pastor. Mati, ¿dónde vas? Vaya, pastor, vaya. Ahora yo voy. Después voy. Mandar un taxi a la iglesia, por favor. Sí, a Buenos Aires. ¿Te dejo esta orden para autorizar, por favor? Bueno. Hola. Buen día. Mirá, venimos por Juan Rodríguez. Sí, ¿usted es familiar? No, no. Yo soy pastor y ella es la mamá. ¿Ella es la mamá? Bueno. Tomen asiento, ahora sale la doctora y les va a informar cómo está él. Tomen asiento en el fondo. Muy bueno. Gracias. Oh, voy a llamar a Laura, ella me está esperando y no sabe nada. Bueno, que tengas buen día. No le dan muchas esperanzas. ¿Usted no puede orar por ella? Sí, pero tengo... Espere, espere. Pero, pero para. Hola. ¿Usted puede hacer algo por mi hija? Mira, yo no puedo hacer nada. Por favor, haga algo por mi hija. Pero podemos pedirle a Dios que haga algo. Vamos. Se llama Marlene. Señor, hoy nos juntamos acá en este lugar por, para pedirte por la vida de Marlene, Señor. Yo sé que vos tenés el control completo sobre su vida. Yo sé que vos podés sanarla. Todos confiamos acá en este lugar. Hicimos todo lo que estuvo a nuestro alcance, lo que estuvo en nuestras manos de hacer. Gracias. Lo lamento. Gracias. Hijo, tu hermano te está esperando. Son Por los favor. últimos minutos. Aprovechalos. Tranquila. Gracias. Gracias. Todo va a estar bien.
Mi hermano. ¿Cómo estás, hermanito? Parece que me va. No, Juan. No te podés ir. Yo te necesito. Son lo más importante para mí. Me equivoqué, Mati. Mucho me equivoqué. Maduro. Cabezón. No, vos sos un capo, Juan. ¿Sabes quién era un capo? El viejo. ¿Te acuerdas del viejo? Sí, poco, pero me acuerdo. Te quería mucho. Te quería mucho, Mati. Me decía, cuidado, no necesita que lo cuide. Yo no entendí. Hice la mía. Pensé en mí nada más. Perdóname, Mati. ¿Que te perdone qué? Nada. No es tarde, Mati. Vos podés hacer lo que yo no supe. En estos días aprendí. Entendí lo que decía el viejo. Agarra la mochila. Alcanzame la mochila. Saca la Biblia. Saca la Biblia, dale. Ahí está todo. Ahí está todo, Mati. Él permaneció. Ahí está todo, en el libro del pastor. De esto me hablaba el viejo. Él quería que haga lo mismo que, que hizo él. Pero yo no entendí nada. Pero vos no, Mati. Vos no podés ser como yo. Yo quiero ser como vos, Juan. Yo te quiero. No, Mati. No. Escuchame. De donde yo vengo no hay nada. No hay nada, ¿entendés? Es todo vacío. Todo oscuro. Pero él sabía cómo eran las cosas. ¿Dónde estaba, Dios? Y siempre lo siguió, ¿sabes? Como dice ahí. Permaneció. En Juan 15. Juan 15, Mati. Como dice ahí. Y permaneció. Y yo volví al patio con la vieja. El viejo podando la parra. Cuidando las uvas. ¿Entendés? Vamos a ir juntos, Juan. Vamos a ir. Me tenés que prometer, Mati. Me tenés que prometer que vas a volver a casa. Que, que vas a creer en Dios como te enseñó el viejo. Que vas a permanecer, Mati. Que vas a dar fruto. Como quería el viejo. Prometemelo. Prometemelo, dale. Apurate, dale. Dale. Llamo al pastor, Mati. Llamo al pastor. Pastor, venga. Ah, sí, pato. No tenés nada que agradecer, Juan. Invítelo, pato. Invítelo, pato. Invítelo como ayer. Invítelo. Invítelo a Jesús. Invítelo, invítelo ahora que estamos todos, ahora que está el Mati, estoy yo, 
está la vieja, el viejo. Invítelo, pato. Invítelo a que venga. Invítelo. Él ya está acá, Juan. Él ya está acá. Señor. Ayúdanos, Señor. Ayúdanos a seguir, papá. Ayúdanos a permanecer, papá. Te necesito. Puerto Madero fue modificado hacia 1990 para darle su aspecto moderno actual, convirtiéndolo en un centro destacado de esparcimiento y de tendencias arquitectónicas, gastronómicas y de arte, ampliando la posibilidad de... Señor Mario Peralta. Sí. Queda usted detenido, me tiene que acompañar. Pero por, Póngale las esposas. Le hable los derechos. No, no pero se, tiene se derecho está a la se, se, se está confundiendo, no, no, no puede ser verdad esto. Se está confundiendo a personas, yo no, no tengo nada que ver, pero, pero ¿por qué me detienen? ¿Pero, ¿Pero por qué? ¿Por qué? Un error, ¿eh? está cometiendo un error. Yo no sé por qué es lo que se me acusa, ¿qué es lo que se me acusa? ¿Por qué no me dicen? ¿Eh? Laura, Laura. José, ¿cómo estás? ¿Necesitas una mano? No, no es necesario. Se me rompió una abrazadera, así que ahora voy a tener que ir a comprarla y ya volveré. Uh -huh. Sí, eso es todo. Me voy a tener que esperar un momento, voy a comprar una abrazadera para reparar una mentira y vuelvo. Laura, ¿a dónde va? Se asustó. Se va. No es mi lugar. Yo no pertenezco a este lugar. No aguanto más. Laura. Venga, por favor. Baje a tomar aire. Esto tiene para rato. ¿Y por lo que dijo? Nada, porque no le dije nada. ¿Cómo? Lo abandona, se va y él ni se enteró. Usted no entiende. Él me abandonó primero. Me cambió por este pueblo, por ese sucucho que llama iglesia. Yo ya no le importo. Cualquier persona que viene y toca la puerta pasa a ser más importante que yo. Laura, está celosa. No. ¿Pero cómo se defiende o se convive con el amor de una persona que ya no está? Que no consigue recursos. Que lo único que sabe hacer es decir, confía, ya vas a ver un poco más. 
que cree que Dios le puede cambiar la vida a todos. Menos a él, claro. No, pero ¿no cree más en él? Yo ya le di una oportunidad. Y no, no le creo más al pastor. Me gustaba más de oficinista. Laura, no le preguntaba por Pablo. Le pregunto por Dios. Si no le cree más a Dios. Él no juega a los dados con las personas. Créame, sé por qué se lo digo. ¿Usted piensa que, que Él los trajo hasta acá para entrar en la vida de toda esta gente sin esperanza y abandonarlos a la nada? Creo que Él tiene un plan mucho más grande. De hecho, ya lo está haciendo. Solo una persona puede detenerlo. Y no es Dios. Pablo la ama. Lo sé, lo veo. Y usted también lo sabe. Pasa que está atravesando un desierto. Pero puede hacerlo. Solo que... Si usted se va... Ya no sería lo mismo. Y no sé si él podría seguir adelante. Yo no le dije que se metiera en ese desierto. La vida... A veces es un desierto. Es como médanos que el viento... Lleva de aquí para allá. Por momentos vemos el mar y por momentos no, pero hay que seguir adelante. ¿Y cómo se sabe dónde es adelante y dónde es atrás? Solo Dios. Solo Dios y su amor por usted y toda esa gente es la guía que lo va a llevar adelante. Laura, escuche su corazón. Esa niña asustada que salió corriendo de la casa es una reacción de dudas, temores y miedo. Pero el amor que siente usted por Pablo es mucho más fuerte y la va a impulsar adelante. Y la va a llevar a buen puerto. Laura, yo voy a unas cuadras de acá y hasta el taller a buscar el auto. Y si le parece nos vemos en el pueblo. Le, le digo a José que la lleve. ¿Me va a obligar a volver? No, Laura. No. Esto es libre albedrío. Nos vemos, José. Bueno, bueno. Muchas gracias. Sí, hasta luego. Hasta luego. Salvi, ¿lo alcanzamos hasta el taller? Bueno, ¿cómo no? Usted sí que sabe convencer a una mujer, ¿eh? ¿Es soltero? ¿No piensa casarse? Sí, sí. Pienso casarme. ¿Cogí esta y todo? Cogí esta y todo, sí. ¿Y vestido blanco? Uh -huh. Se ve que la ama mucho. Si la amo, daría mi vida por ella. Salvi, si hace fiesta me gustaría ir. Mire, a la fiesta están invitados usted, Pablo y toda esta gente. Hay lugar para todos. ¿Sabe qué? Si me dejan, yo me bajo acá. ¿Puede ser? No sé qué me pasó. 
Me asusté. No, mi amor, yo te descuidé. Pero es que todo pasó tan rápido. No, yo me dejé llevar, pero gracias a Salvador me di cuenta que acá tenés mucho que hacer y que la gente te necesita. Nos necesita, amor. Perdón que interrumpa. Pastor, pero acá lo buscan. Pastor, en el hospital preguntan por usted. Marlene se despertó, salió del coma. ¡Vamos! Vamos, que me contás en el camino. Gracias, Salvi. Permanece en mí, yo soy la vida. Permanece en mí, vive de verdad. Eres la rama, fruto llevarás. Yo soy la vida, permanece en mí. que viva sin mí no hay crecimiento sin servir yo te aseguro podrás sentir todo mi amor corriendo a ti permanece en mí yo soy la vida, permanece en mí, vive de verdad, eres la rama y fruto llevarás. Yo soy la vida, permanece en mí. también debes 
es amar como te amé Eres testigo del amor que te mostré En gestos simples muéstrame Permanece en mí Yo soy la vida Permanece en mí Vive de verdad, eres la rama y fruto llevarás. Yo soy la vid, permanece en mí. Mi propósito está en ti Pide en mi nombre Dios cumplirá Lo que me pidas te dará Permanece en mí Yo soy la vida Permanece en mí Vive de verdad, tú eres la rama, el fruto llevarás. Yo soy la vida, permanece en mí. Yo soy la vida, permanece en mí. Let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will also be with me where I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Thousands of years of preparation, God was about to send the promised Savior Messiah King into the world. But who would he be? And how would he come? King then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. If we could travel back through time and space, back, back, way back, before there were people, planets, or stars, we would witness the power and glory behind the first words of Scripture. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. 
it was time to prepare the planet for people. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. Each day of creation gives us a clue as to what God is like. Day one shows us that God is holy. He is perfect and pure like light. Day two, God is all powerful. He made and maintains the atmosphere. Day three, God is good. He created thousands of plants and foods for us. Day four, God is faithful. The sun and the moon stay in their orbits. Day five, God is life. He put fish in the sea and birds in the sky. Day six, God is love. After God created the animals, it was time to form the creatures upon whom he would pour out his love. It was time to create the special beings who could reflect his holiness, power, goodness, faithfulness, life, and love. On the sixth day of creation, the king conversed within himself, God, his Holy Spirit, and his word, saying, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over all the earth and over all the creatures. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The first man and woman were created with the ability to think, love, and speak like their creator so that they could enjoy a close relationship with him. After making the first human body from dust and breathing life into it, God planted a garden in Eden somewhere in the Middle East. A crystal clear river flowed through the garden. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. The Lord God did not ask Adam if he wanted to live in Eden. God was man's creator owner. He knew what was best for man. The Lord God commanded the man you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. This was not a difficult command. Adam could eat any of the fruits in the garden, except one. By obeying this simple rule, Adam could show that he trusted his creator to know what was best for him. What did God say would happen to Adam if he broke this rule? Did God tell Adam that if he ate the forbidden fruit, he must begin to do religious rituals, use prayer beads, fast, give alms, go to a church, synagogue, or mosque, and try to do enough good deeds to balance out his bad deeds? Is that what God said? No. That is not what God said. God told Adam, when you eat of it, you will surely die. Disobedience to God's law is called sin. The penalty for breaking God's rule would be death. In his book, the king calls this the law of sin and death. The king's law says that sin must be punished with death. Death means separation. If Adam disobeyed God's one rule, he would become like a broken branch which begins to wither and die the instant it is separated from its source of life. 
If Adam decided to do what he wanted to do instead of what the king of the universe told him to do, that would be an act of rebellion. That would be sin. Sin would end man's friendship with God. Sin would cause man's body to grow old and die. Sin would separate man's spirit, soul, and body from God forever. Sin is deadly. After God had given the first man a job to do and a rule to obey, it was time to form the first woman. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Like Adam, Eve was created in the image of God. She too was made to know her creator owner, reflect his character, and enjoy a happy relationship with him forever. The Lord God cared for Adam and Eve like a wise and loving father. Each evening, he would come into the garden to walk and talk with them. They were happy and comfortable in his presence. But Satan was not happy. He hated God, and he hated these two creatures who reflected the image of God. So the devil, who had failed to seize the kingdom of heaven, plotted to take over the kingdom of earth. If only he could get Adam, the head of the human race, to choose to break God's law. But he would not tempt Adam directly. One day, Eve heard a voice. It wasn't Adam. It wasn't God. It was a serpent. For Eve, a talking reptile was just another new discovery. She had no idea that God's enemy was using the serpent, nor did she know Satan wanted to use her to tempt Adam to break God's law. The serpent had waited patiently his calculating eyes tracking the woman. Then, at the opportune moment, he hissed out to her. Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Satan wanted Eve to doubt God's word. He also wanted her to think that God was keeping something good from her and her husband. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Who should Eve trust? Her creator or a creature? When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. She ate it, he ate it. Eve ate the forbidden fruit because she was deceived by Satan's tricks. Adam ate it because he deliberately chose to go his own way instead of God's way. Instead of submitting to their holy and loving creator, mankind had surrendered to the enemy. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked they tried to cover their shame with fig leaves, but no amount of self-effort could fix their problem. They were helpless to get rid of the sin that had invaded their souls. They were helpless to restore the honor they had lost. 
the first couple had become like a branch broken off a living tree. Their sin had broken off their relationship with the king of the universe. Spiritually, they were dead. Their sin had separated them from the source of eternal life. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And God said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? On the same day Adam and Eve sinned, God announced some of the far-reaching consequences of their sin. Because of their sin, Adam and Eve had lost dominion over the earth. Their world would now include thorns, pain, sadness, sickness, and death. Mankind had sinned and mankind must die. The law of sin and death required it. Man had no way to save himself from the curse of sin. Was there any hope? Satan had stolen the king's special treasure but the king had a secret plan to buy it back. Because the ransom price the king planned to pay would be so unthinkably high, neither demons nor humans would understand his plan until after it was fulfilled. On the same day Satan captured the human race, God said to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This was the first of many prophecies in which God would, little by little, make known his secret plan to rescue people from Satan, sin, and death. But to hide that plan from Satan and his followers, the king put the prophecy in code. God promised to send to earth a savior, the offspring of a woman. The savior would have a human mother but no human father. He would be known as the Messiah, meaning the chosen one. Satan would strike the Messiah's heel, but the Messiah would crush Satan's head. What did all this mean? Later the king would make it clear, but for now, God had given Adam and Eve a ray of hope. Thousands of years later, one of the king's prophets would write, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. The virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. God is with us. The king would ransom his special treasure. But how much would it cost? Do you remember what Adam and Eve did after they ate the forbidden fruit? They made coverings of fig leaves. Did their coverings make them feel comfortable in the presence of their creator judge? No, they felt ashamed and guilty. They had no way to make themselves right with God. So God did something for them. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Who made the first animal sacrifice ever? God did. Because of what the Lord did for them, Adam and Eve were happy to be with God again. The animal blood covered their sin. Adam and Eve deserved to die that day, but innocent animals had died in their place. The animal skin robes covered their shame. Once again, Adam and Eve felt comfortable to be in the presence of God. Thousands of years later, one of God's prophets wrote, I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God. 
For he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation and draped me in a robe of righteousness. Only God has a way to make sinners right again. Still, sin has consequences. Just as God put Lucifer and his evil angels out of the heavenly paradise, so now God put the man and his wife out of the earthly paradise. After banishing them from the garden, the Lord God stationed mighty angelic beings to the east of Eden, and a flaming sword flashed back and forth, guarding the way to the tree of life. Our great creator God is holy. This means he is pure, clean, perfect, and righteous. Because of his holy nature and holy laws, he must punish sin with death, separation from the source of life. Some people think that God is so great that he can ignore the laws he himself has decreed. Imagine a courtroom where the judge refuses to enforce the laws of the land. Would you say that such a judge is great? Imagine a football match where the head referee ignores the rules of the game. Would you call him a great referee or a bad referee? Satan wanted Eve to believe that her creator would not enforce his rules, that he would not punish lawbreakers with death. But the righteous king and judge of the universe always keeps his word. God is great. You can trust him. Outside the garden, the world was still a beautiful place, but it also included bad things like prickly thorns, pesky bugs, skinned knees, and stuffy noses. Many animals were no longer friendly. Food was not easy to find. Adam and Eve had to work hard just to fill their hungry stomachs. They also had moments of happiness and joy. Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Eve named the world's first baby Cain, meaning possession. What a precious treasure from God. Perhaps she thought her son would be the promised savior, but she soon discovered her cute little boy was stubborn and self-centered, just like his parents. Later, when their second son was born, Eve named him Abel, meaning vanity or nothing. Clearly, Adam and Eve could not produce the sinless offspring of a woman who would save people from their sins. Instead of reflecting God's holy image, Adam and Eve's offspring reflected their own sin-bent natures. Adam had sons and daughters in his own likeness, in his own image. Do you see Cain grabbing the melon from his little brother? He is acting like his parents, who took the fruit that was not theirs. Like a contagious disease, Adam and Eve's sin had infected their children. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. An African proverb says, a rat can only produce offspring that dig. An Arab proverb voices the same fact. The son of a duck is a floater. When our first parents sinned, they became like a branch broken from a tree. Just as every twig and leaf on the broken branch is affected, so every member of Adam's family branch is affected by Adam's sin. Was there a way for God to pardon Cain and Abel and declare them righteous in his sight? Yes, but it would be very, very costly. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That unbreakable law of the universe, the law of sin and death, must be carried out. Sin must be punished with death. That is why the king's way of forgiveness required a death payment. While the sinner deserved to die, 
God would accept the blood of certain kinds of animals, such as a lamb. The lamb could not be sick or scratched or dirty. It had to be healthy and clean. It had to be a perfect lamb. The lamb would be killed and burned. It would die in the place of the guilty sinner. The lamb would be the sinner's substitute. One day, both brothers brought offerings to God, but only one brought the right offering. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Which offering do you think God accepted? The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. Because he trusted in the Lord and his plan, Abel was forgiven and declared righteous. This was God's gift to Abel. God had loaded Abel's sins onto the lamb. The lamb had died in Abel's place. God's righteous anger against sin had fallen on the lamb instead of on Abel. Why was God pleased with Abel's sacrificed lamb? Because it pointed to the coming Savior who would one day pay off the sin debt of the world. Cain approached God with his prayers, but he ignored God's law that says sin must be punished with death. Cain was religious, but he was not in a right relationship with God. The law of sin and death still hung over him like a dark cloud. If he did not trust God and his plan, he would never know God as his friend. He would face God as his judge. Ten long generations after Adam first sinned, God gave this sad report on the human family. The wickedness of man was great on the earth, and the thoughts of his heart were only evil all the time. But one family on earth still trusted God. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. For a whole century, Noah built the ark together with his wife, his three sons and their wives. As he worked, Noah warned the world of God's coming judgment but people just mocked him. Finally, the ark was ready. On that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth and the floodgates of the heavens were opened and rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. It was the worst natural disaster in history Except for eight souls sheltered in the ark, all humanity perished. A proud, unbelieving world learned the truth too late. Geological and fossil records affirm the biblical record. From the Sahara to the Himalayas, marine fossils can be unearthed in the world's great deserts and mountains. In his mercy, God is patient, but in his justice, he will judge sin. Do you know the first thing Noah did after his family and the animals came out of the ark? Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma. God's justice and mercy had not changed. Sin still required a death payment. That is why Noah shed the blood of innocent creatures and burned their bodies on an altar 
suspended between heaven and earth, between God and man. Such sacrifices pointed to the sinless Messiah who would one day come to earth to provide the real payment for sin. Ten generations had passed since the time of the prophet Noah. Satan had a solid grip on the nations, or so it seemed. Instead of trusting in the Lord, people trusted in their religions. Some nations worshiped the sun instead of the one who made it. Others bowed to the moon. The year was about 1925 BC. In a land northeast of Arabia lived an elderly man named Abram. Later, God changed his name to Abraham, meaning father of a multitude. Abraham was 75 years old. Sarah, his wife, was 65 and childless. Their parents and neighbors were idolaters, worshiping created things instead of the Creator. One day, the Lord said to Abraham, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. If Abraham would trust and follow the Lord, Abraham and his wife were old and had no children. Yet the Lord had promised to make Abraham the father of a great nation. How did Abraham react to God's impossible promise? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. Like all of Adam's descendants, Abraham was a sinner. But like Abel and Noah, Abraham offered sin offerings to God. Because Abraham believed the Lord and his promises, God credited righteousness to Abraham's record in heaven and gave him the gift of eternal life. Sarah also trusted the son of the promise. Look at the picture. Do you see Abraham and his wife looking up into the night sky? They are thanking the Lord for his faithfulness. Later, Hagar and Ishmael were sent away, but God was good to them too. God was with the boy as he grew up in the wilderness of Paran. He became an expert archer, and his mother arranged a marriage for him with a young woman from Egypt. Ishmael became the father of the mighty Arab people, whom God has blessed in so many ways. As for Isaac, he remained at home, caring for his father's cattle and flocks. Sometimes Isaac helped his father select a healthy lamb, kill it, and burn it on an altar for their sins. But neither Isaac nor his father could imagine the sacrifice God was about to require. Here is the story straight from the scriptures. Some time later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. How could Abraham's son come back if he was to be killed and his body burned? The scripture says, 
Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead. God had promised to make Isaac the father of a new nation through which the promised Savior would come. God cannot lie. For Abraham, that was enough. Meanwhile, what was Isaac thinking? He knew he was a sinner and that he deserved to die for his sins. He also knew that God would accept a substitute. But today, they were going to a place of sacrifice without a ram or a lamb? It made no sense. So Isaac said to his dad, the fire and wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. All these events pictured God's plan to send to earth a holy savior who would satisfy the requirements of the law of sin and death and rescue sinners from every nation on earth. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Why did Abraham name the mountain, the Lord will provide? instead of the Lord has provided? Had not God just provided a ransom? By naming the mountain the Lord will provide, the prophet Abraham was foretelling the day when, on this same mountain, God himself would provide a sacrifice with blood so costly that God would accept it as full payment for the sin debt of the world, so that whoever believes in that sacrifice will not perish, but have eternal life. Some 1900 years after the prophet Abraham offered the ram on the altar, the promised savior himself would look back to this historic event and say, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. As the smoke of the ram rose heavenward, God gave Abraham a glimpse of a future burnt offering that would be sacrificed on this same mountain ridge. Suddenly, Abraham's answer to his son's question, where is the lamb, took on a deeper meaning. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. For Abraham and his son, God had not yet provided the lamb. He had provided a ram. Where was the lamb? At the right time, God himself would provide the answer. Do you remember the two big promises the Lord made to Abraham? First, God had said, I will make you into a great nation. God kept his word. Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob's secret plan was moving forward. Around 1500 BC, God called Moses, a descendant of Abraham, to be his prophet. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. God also used Moses to lead Abraham's three million descendants away from four centuries of slavery. God himself guided them through the hostile desert with a pillar of cloud to provide shade during the day and with a pillar of fire to provide light at night. By his mighty arm, he opened a path of escape for them in the Red Sea. 
gave them bread from heaven and water from a rock and brought them to Mount Sinai. There at the base of the mountain, God told the people, You will be for me a kingdom and a holy nation. God wanted this nation to be holy, set apart for him and distinct from the nations around them. But the people did not understand what it meant to be holy. They did not see themselves as helpless sinners. They thought they could somehow earn God's favor. To teach them a lesson about his burning anger against sin, the Lord came down in an earth-shaking display of blazing fire and blasting trouble. Then Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. God had given Adam one rule. He was about to give this new nation ten. God told Moses that they must obey all ten rules perfectly. Cursed is the man who does not uphold the words of this law. How do you think the people felt after they heard these ten commands? Do you think they still thought they were good enough? How about you? Do you think you are good enough to live in God's perfect kingdom? Read again rule number one. You shall have no other gods before me. Do you always put God first? If not, you have failed to keep this law. Read number five. Honor your father and your mother. If you have ever disobeyed your father or mother, you are guilty before God. Now look at rule eight. You shall not steal. If you have ever taken something that is not yours or cheated on an exam, you have broken this law. Have you ever told a lie? Then you have not obeyed rule number nine. The last commandment tells us it is wrong even to want to have what belongs to someone else. God sees the sin in our hearts. How many sins did it take to ruin Adam and Eve's relationship with God? Just one. God's perfect standard has not changed. Whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. God is holy. The Ten Commandments gave the new nation a clear standard of right and wrong. That was a good thing, but God's law also brought bad news. It showed the people that they were in big trouble. Because of their sins, they must all die and be separated from God. The good news was that the Lord would still accept the shed blood of lambs, bulls, goats and doves to cover their sins. And so on the same day that God thundered out his Ten Commandments, God told Moses, make an altar and sacrifice on it your burnt offerings. But this system of offering animal blood for the forgiveness of sins was only a picture of what God really required. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Animals were not created in God's image. The value of a lamb is not equal to the value of a man. Just as you cannot take a toy car to a car dealer and offer it as payment for a real car, so the blood of a lamb could not pay the high price required by the law of sin and death. A better sacrifice was needed. While animal sacrifices could not take away the sin debt of the world, they gave sinners a picture of the one who could. As the time for the Savior's arrival got closer and closer, the Lord told his prophets to write many more prophecies about this Messiah King. Here are a few of those ancient promises. 
The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. But you, Bethlehem, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. He will be called Wonderful, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. Your God will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. They have pierced my hands and my feet. The promised Savior was coming. But when? And who would he be? How would these prophecies be fulfilled? It was time. After thousands of years of preparation, God was about to send the promised Savior Messiah King into the world. But who would he be? And how would he come? In the time of Herod, king of Judea, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Why did Gabriel call Jesus the Son of God? Some people think this term means that God took a wife and fathered a son. That is not what it means. If you are from the continent of Africa, some may call you a son of Africa. Does this mean Africa got married and had a child? No, it means you come from Africa. The Messiah is called the Son of God because he came from God. He came into Adam's sin-ruined family, but did not originate from it. He is the very Word, Soul, and Son of God. Do you remember the promise God made on the day Adam ate the forbidden fruit? God had announced that the offspring of a woman would crush the serpent's head. That promised offspring was now in the womb of a virgin girl. How he would crush the serpent's head remained to be seen. 700 years earlier, the prophet Micah had foretold that the Messiah King would be born in Bethlehem, the ancient hometown of King David. But there was a problem. Mary and Joseph lived in Nazareth, a three-day journey to the north. How would the scriptures be fulfilled? God had everything under control. As the time approached for Mary to give birth, the Roman Emperor Caesar Augustus issued a decree that all subjects of the empire must return at once to the city of their ancestors to register to pay taxes. So Joseph and a very pregnant Mary traveled from Nazareth to Bethlehem.
While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. There in Bethlehem, overcrowded with weary travelers in town for the tax registration, the promised offspring of a woman was born. The gospel records the event with precision. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. On his mother's side, this baby was the newborn son of Mary. But on his father's side, he was the eternal son of God. The same word by which God created the world. The same voice which thundered from fiery Mount Sinai could now be heard in a baby's soft cry. And where was he born? Not in the palace of a king, not in a hospital, not even in a wayside inn. The king from heaven was born where baby lambs are born, in a barn with a feeding trough for his bed. It was all part of God's plan. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. <laughs> to whom did God first make known the news of the Messiah's coming to earth? To the emperor? The rich and famous? The religious leaders? No. The first to receive the electrifying news were poor shepherds, men who raised lambs to be sacrificed on the temple altar in Jerusalem. There were shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us. Some people believed the shepherds' message. Most did not. But believe it or not, the king, whose birthday split world history in two, had joined the human race. After Jesus' birth in the barn, Joseph arranged to have proper lodging for his little family. One day, some excited magi, wise men who study the stars, arrived in Jerusalem. Led by a special star, these men had come from far away Persia in search of the newborn king. These wise men had one question and one purpose. Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and said, go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, 
they went on their way, and the star they had and having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Herod tried to murder the child. The people of Jerusalem ignored him, but the Magi, who crossed a scorching desert to find him, worshipped him and gave him gifts fit for a king, gold, incense, and a costly spice for embalming the dead. Why the embalming spice? Did these wise men know that Jesus had been born to die? After the angel's warning, Joseph took Mary and the child Jesus to Egypt, where they lived as refugees until the death of cruel King Herod. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. This fulfilled another ancient prophecy spoken by the Lord. Out of Egypt I called my son. So Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Nazareth, where he grew up along with his half-brothers and sisters. In many ways, the boy Jesus was like other children. He ate, slept, played, studied, and learned a trade. But in other ways, Jesus was different from other kids. He was never selfish. He always honored his parents. He never lied. He always pleased his Father in heaven. He was holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners. Jesus is the only perfect child in history. Perfect does not mean he never had a skinned knee or a pimple. It means he had a perfect nature. He was perfectly holy and good. He was also perfect in power and wisdom. But before entering Mary's womb, he imposed on himself certain limitations so that he might live as a human among humans. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. When Jesus was 12 years old, he traveled with his parents from Nazareth to Jerusalem for the annual feast of the sacrifice, known as the Passover. While his boyhood friends explored the big city, Jesus spent the week in the temple courtyard, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. The temple was the place where lambs were burned on an altar for the sins of the people. The boy Jesus understood what the scholars did not. He had come to offer the last lamb. Thirty years had passed since Jesus' birth in Bethlehem. Caesar Augustus was dead. His stepson, Caesar Tiberius, reigned over the Roman Empire. Herod Antipas ruled in Galilee. Pontius Pilate governed in Judea. And a new prophet was preaching in Palestine. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Hundreds of years earlier, Two prophets, Isaiah and Malachi, wrote about a future prophet who would announce the Messiah King's arrival. John was that prophet. While the previous prophets had prophesied, at the right time the promised Savior will come to earth, John preached, that time has come, the Savior is here. Crowds streamed into the desert to hear John. 
those who confessed their condition as sinners in need of the Savior were baptized in the Jordan River. In this way they showed their faith in the Messiah who would wash away their great debt of sin and clothe them in his righteousness. Day after day, week after week, John spoke to the people about the long-awaited Savior from heaven, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Then one day, the Savior came. Over the hill, through the crowd, and down to where John was baptizing. Be that this perfect man was living in his kingdom. But the devil had a strategy. Just as he had tempted the first man to sin, so now he would try to get this man to sin. The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. When Adam sinned, Mankind lost the right to rule the earth. Satan had stolen the dominion of the world, making himself its king. Now the king of glory was on earth to take back the dominion, but he would not do it by bowing to the one he had come to crush. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Satan had never tempted anyone like him, a man who had no desire or capacity to sin. Jesus was different from Adam and his descendants. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. When Satan tempted Adam to sin, Adam lost and Satan won. When Satan tried to get Jesus to sin, Satan lost and Jesus won. The first man led us into Satan's kingdom of sin and death. The second man came to lead us out. In the scriptures of the prophets, one of the Messiah's titles is the arm of the Lord. The miracles of Jesus showed him to be God's arm on earth. With a touch of his hand or a word from his mouth, the sick and dying were instantly made well. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute and many others and laid them at his feet and he healed them. The words of the prophets were being fulfilled. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear. The dead are raised and the good news is preached to the poor. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus, moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. When the sun was setting, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Christ. Jesus did not want the demons testifying about him, these evil angels had witnessed his authority and power when he spoke the heavens and earth into place. 
They shuddered as they recalled the day he threw them out of heaven. And now he was living on earth as a man. Their master's dominion was crumbling. The king of glory had invaded their domain. Wherever Jesus went, Satan's power was being weakened. Wherever Jesus went, sin's curse was being rolled back. Along with the miracles, Jesus had a message. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus selected 12 or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to fulfill them. Jesus had dominion over every part of creation. Yet he didn't go around saying, worship me, I two stories. Who do you think Jesus is? Jesus went to a town called Nain On another day, Jesus visited two grieving sisters, Martha and Mary. Four days earlier, their brother Lazarus had died. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. Jesus came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory and go? The Lord Jesus is the only person in history who could say, I am the resurrection and the life. His works proved that his words were true. The teachers and priests of the Jews were not happy to see the crowds listening to Jesus. They wanted the people to listen to them, not him. One day, the chief priests sent their temple guards to arrest Jesus, but they could not do it. When they returned, the priests asked them, why didn't you bring him in? The guards answered, no one ever spoke the way this man does. Not even. As the time approached for the Messiah to fulfill his mission, he led three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, up a high mountain. There, he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then, there appeared before them Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. A bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. The disciples never forgot what they saw that day. Later, 
Peter would write, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And John would say, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. But for now, the Son's glory would remain hidden in his body of flesh. It was time for the King to fulfill his mission. For three years, the Lord Jesus had been traveling around Palestine, doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil. The common people loved him, but the religious leaders in Jerusalem were plotting to kill him, and Jesus knew it. It was the eve of the annual feast of the sacrifice called the Passover. The next day, thousands of lambs would be killed. Though Jesus knew that he too would be killed the next day, he spent the evening sharing a last supper with his disciples. At midnight, he led his disciples to a garden called Gethsemane. There, knowing the horrors that awaited him, he prayed to his father. Then, as if on cue, the religious leaders arrived with a mob of armed men. Jesus let the men bind him and lead him to the high priest's house where the Jewish rulers had gathered. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses? He asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists and said, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. The Jewish court had passed the death sentence, but it did not have the authority to carry it out. Only a Roman court could do that. It was early morning when the religious rulers and a growing mob led Jesus from the high priest's house through the streets of Jerusalem to the palace of the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. The religious leaders wanted Pilate to put Jesus to death. They began at once to state their case. This man has been leading our people to ruin by telling them not to pay their taxes to the Roman government and by claiming he is the Messiah, a king. After interrogating Jesus, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? Pilate asked. With this, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But the mob kept screaming, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate knew Jesus was innocent. But because he was afraid of the religious leaders and their mob, he condemned Jesus to death. Pilate sentenced Jesus to the extreme penalty of Roman law, a brutal beating followed by crucifixion. Some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters and called out the entire battalion. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They made a crown of long, sharp thorns and put it on his head, and they placed a stick in his right hand as a scepter. Then they knelt before him in mockery, yelling, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and grabbed the stick and beat him on the head with it. The soldiers were ignorant of the meaning of the crown of thorns they had jammed onto Jesus' head. Thorns were part of the curse that came over the earth because of Adam's sin. The Holy King of Glory had come to take sin's curse for us. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. 
Two convicted criminals were also led out with Jesus. Each was made to carry his own cross to the place of execution. Part way into the grim parade, the Roman soldiers forced a man from North Africa to carry Jesus' cross for him. Then on they went, through Jerusalem's crowded streets, outside the city walls, and up a hill called Golgotha, the northern part of Mount Moriah where, about 1900 years earlier, the prophet Abraham had said, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. It was time for that lamb to die. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the Chosen One. If Jesus had saved himself, he could not have saved us. God's rescue plan was being fulfilled in every detail. On the same mountain where the prophet Abraham had said, God himself will provide the lamb and the Lord will provide, God had provided his very own lamb, Jesus. Do you remember how the innocent ram was sacrificed on the wood on an altar to ransom Abraham's condemned son? Now the sinless son of God was being sacrificed on a wooden cross to ransom Adam's condemned descendants. God spared Abraham's son, but he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors and the ransom he paid was not mere gold or silver. He paid for you with the precious lifeblood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. That is how much you are worth to God. It is noon. Jesus has already been on the cross for three hours. Dark clouds roll in. Day becomes like night. Terrified onlookers scatter. An eerie silence covers the hill. Three hours later, Jesus cries out. My God! My God! Why have you forsaken me? On the altar of the cross, the eternal Son of God felt the horror of being separated from God in heaven. During those hours of darkness, hidden from the eyes of men, God took all our sins and put them on His Holy Son, Jesus became the final sin offering. As the past, present, and future sins of the world were loaded onto Jesus, God in heaven had to look away because his eyes are too pure to look on evil. For three long hours, God's anger against sin blazed down on his own burnt offering. Like a lamb sacrificed on an altar, the Lamb of God was suspended on the cross between heaven and earth, between God and man. The Infinite One endured our hell in time so that we need not endure it in eternity. Then it was done. 
knowing that he had absorbed the punishment sinners deserve and that he had fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament, Jesus said, It is finished! Then he bowed his head and released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. For centuries, lambs had been killed and burned on the temple altar. When Jesus died, God tore open the curtain that hid the special room where the blood was sprinkled each year to cover sin. By ripping the curtain, God was declaring, It is finished! The sin debt is paid in full! My lamb has shed his holy blood for the sin of the world. I will no longer accept animal blood for sins. My beloved son is the final sacrifice. For all who believe in him, heaven's door is wide open. Seven hundred years earlier, the prophet Isaiah wrote, He was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. It is finished. Since the day Adam sinned, death had reigned like a cruel king over the human family. If Jesus had ever sinned, death would also have made his body begin to decay, stink, and slowly turn into dust. But 1,000 years earlier, the prophet David had written, you will not let your Holy One see decay. Death and the grave had no power over the one who never sinned. On the third day after Jesus was killed and buried, early Sunday morning, several women came to the tomb to pay their respects. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake as an angel came down from heaven pushed aside the stone and sat on it. The soldiers fainted, but the angel told the women, Don't be afraid. I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He has been raised from the dead, just as he said would happen. Come, see where his body was lying. And now, go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead. The women ran quickly from the tomb. They were very frightened, but also filled with great joy. And they rushed to find the disciples to give them the angel's message. And as they went, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. And they ran to him, held his feet, and worshipped him. Meanwhile, the soldiers came into the city and told the religious leaders what had happened. So the leaders bribed them with a huge sum of money, telling them, You must say, Jesus' disciples came during the night while we were sleeping, and they stole his body. But their lies could not hide the truth. The tomb was empty. By his death, Jesus paid our sin debt. By his burial, Jesus went down into the pit of death and decay. By his resurrection, Jesus overcame death and now says, Don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one who died. Look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. For all who believe this good news, 
death is merely the door that opens into the presence of the king who says, because I live, you also will live. Over the next 40 days, the Lord would abruptly appear to his followers, talk with them, and then disappear. Jesus' resurrected body could go through walls and travel at the speed of thought. While he is the first to have such a body, he will not be the last. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. Forty days after his resurrection, Jesus gathered his disciples on the Mount of Olives outside Jerusalem. The disciples wanted to know when he would return. Jesus answered, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes. And a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem. Meanwhile up in heaven, it was time for the king to be crowned with glory and honor. Imagine the splendor, the colors, the music, the excitement. A hundred million angels talking among themselves. The king is coming home, but he will look different. The one who created man in the image of God will forevermore bear the image of man. A hush settles over the celestial city. Suddenly, the silence is broken with a majestic chorus of trumpets followed by a booming proclamation. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors and let the King of Glory enter. Who is the King of Glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, invincible in battle. Who is the King of Glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of Glory. The gates swing open wide, and to the thunderous applause of heaven, in comes the champion, the Lamb, the battle-scarred Son of Man, Jesus. Through the adoring multitude he walks, up to his father's throne. Turning, he looks out over Adam's ransomed race and sits down. Mission accomplished. Later, heaven's citizens sing this new song to their beloved king. You are worthy. For you were killed and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Then the angels encircle the throne, praising God and saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive honor and glory and praise. 
On Earth today, most of Adam's descendants are still captives in Satan's doomed kingdom of sin and death. But freedom is available. By his death, burial, and resurrection, the Lord Jesus won the decisive battle. To all who trust him, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will also be with me where I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And there was a small group of us that got together with Ron that ended up being very trustworthy co-workers. Your archaeologist believes he's found the ruins of Noah's Ark. I would stake my life on the fact that I know where the Ark of the Covenant is. Kevin Fisher here with ArcDiscovery.com. We're in the Arc Discovery studio. We have a special guest from East Tennessee, Jim Pinkowski, Pinkowski.com. Nice to have you here, Jim. Now, you're famous with Ron Wyatt in illustrating many things related to the discoveries, and one of the most important was this illustration many people have seen of the Ark of the Covenant. So maybe you could tell us about some of your experience with Ron. And oh, yes. I, I met Ron in 1989, and he was in dire need of someone who could help him publish his discoveries material in his newsletter. And so being an artist and a cartoonist and wanting to help, we crossed paths, and I... For 10 years, I, I did whatever I could to help him illustrate his discoveries. And ultimately, in 1994, Ron appointed me to be the manager of his first museum. But in 1993, the year before that, Ron called me up and said it was time to, to do a drawing of what the Ark of the Covenant looked like. Ron wanted to publish it in his fourth newsletter. So I came over to the house. This right here is the very first drawing I did of the Ark of the Covenant for Ron. The way this happened was that we went into Ron's kitchen and Ron and his wife Mary Nell stood on two sides of a smallish round kitchen table and posed as the cherubim standing around the ark. And so I did a pencil sketch of it and then later took it home. I inked it, put on, put on the zipatone and all that stuff. And this drawing ended up being printed in Ron Wyatt's fourth newsletter. Now, as soon as I did this, I realized, well, it's nice to have a drawing that could be in the newsletter, but Ron needs something that he can take to his presentations. 
a nice poster size rendition of what the Ark of the Covenant looked like. So I did two of them in full color. And this is a reduced copy of what the color version looked like and how it turned out. You actually get to see the real thing and it's still hidden in that cave. It's not going to be shown to mankind until God says it's time. And so we do the renderings and we do the models and that and we do the displays. And Ron told us the entire s scenario around why the Ark of the Covenant was in that cave in Jerusalem, why it was there, what happened to it, how it's going to work into the future, witnessing for God to the entire planet when he finally decides to show it, and he will show it to everybody. Mm. So uh, I was... It, Ron had a couple of pictures that he took. You've seen those on his website also. But interestingly enough, they were blurry pictures because God did not want a clear picture taken yet of the real Ark of the Covenant because it's in that cave and you don't get to see the real thing yet. But I think it's awesome to see those blurry photos because it shows... Not that God's Shekinah glory is still in residence over the mercy seat. It's not there. But the thing is, God can supernaturally fuzz mm -hmm. camera film so that the pictures don't turn out clear yet. You can see an indication and in that, but you can't see everything crystal clear. Now, Ron said he saw those things very clearly. And he said once he understood God did not want him to share these with the world... He didn't want Ron running out of the cave saying, here it is, here's the picture. He said the picture turned out clear. And I ran into someone who said that Ron gave them these pictures, but they were not to make them public. So God was purposefully making them blurred. He Ron said he took 600 photographs, different type of media, and finally, you know, a few did turn out. So God has a timing for all this, and now is not the time, you know, for the world to see it. But in the appropriate time, which we think will probably be during the Mark of the Beast showdown that Ron spoke right. of, then people are going to see there's a video in the cave there sitting on the Ten Commandments of Ron removing the Ten Commandments out of the ark, of him holding the Ten Commandments, and then the four angels looking like men are in there. And the world's going to see that videotape that Ron will be presenting the Ark of the Covenant even though he's passed away, he'll get to present it on this video. And the world will see also the blood on the mercy seat. On the left side as you face it, right side if you're behind it. The blood will give a testimony, will authenticate, you know, all of this. Will authenticate Ron Wyatt. You know, people will look in that video. Who is that man? You know, what else did he touch? And so, you know, all the discoveries are, are going to explode at that time, won't they? Absolutely. What I find is really sort of interesting here, Kevin, is you actually managed to meet Ron four years before I met him. <laughs> now, you came by the museum when I was managing the museum, and you yeah. filmed a couple uh, talks and all that stuff about in front of the Ark of the Covenant display there. Yeah. But I met him in 1989, but you met him around 1984. 84, he was in Nashville. I guess he had been recently released from the Saudi prison, you know, so he sort of made the news. And he was in a church there presenting things. And it touched my heart, this evidence, and seeing Ron being sincere. And I thought to myself, I'd like to help, you know, someday. I couldn't at that time. But, uh, you know, when he was passing away, he was terminally ill. He mentioned... Uh, folks doing, you know, PowerPoint to help get the word out. And so, you know, I started my website in 2000, went over to Noah's Ark at that time. But it's just amazing, yeah, what he has done. Um, God, you know, used him. He's definitely a tool that the Lord used to get the word out, to get the truth out. And these things all pertain to judgments, a warning to man. In the past, you know, I judged you people. Now I'm going to judge you in the future. you got to think about your eternal life, your eternal destiny, and so forth. But yeah, Ron, just incredible. You think he's being appreciated more now yes. after the fact. 
Right. It's back in the early days when Ron was trying to communicate these discoveries to people, you know, he didn't have a lot of photographic evidence. And it's very understanding how people would doubt his validity and all that. Because here's a guy walking around saying that I found Mount Sinai or I found Noah's Ark and that. And sorry, I don't have the pictures yet. Yeah. So, of course, people doubted him. Unfortunately, a lot of those people went and wrote up their articles and started to hold negative opinions and just sort of decided that's the final answer in the entire matter. But the thing is, Ron's been dead and gone for 20 years now. We've had more people being able to go out to all the discovery sites and do further work to verify that they're actually what Ron said they were. Unfortunately, those people had an opinion back in the mid 80s. They're not paying attention anymore. Mm -hmm. Their articles are online. Please, people, just ignore those articles <laughs> because they're misleading. They're not well informed. They're not up to date. They're not current. The final answer in this the entire situation about Ron's discoveries and that is that every one of them has been basically proven to be the best evidence for those sites. Mm -hmm. And that, in fact, take, for example, you mentioned when you saw Ron in 1984, he'd just come back from Saudi Arabia where yeah. he and his two sons were locked up in a Saudi jail for 70 some days or whatever. And they confiscated on all, all of his photographs. So he gets back here and he has no pictures to show. Yeah. Well, what's the current situation with Jabal and Laws in Saudi Arabia right now? The Saudis admit to the world that it is the real Mount Sinai, mm -hmm. and they have these detailed plans to build this in huge futuristic city complex around the entire area of Mount Sinai and invite the world to come and see it because it is Mount Sinai. So we go back in time and we hear Ron talking about it and all the people arguing with him. And it's like he didn't have his proof yet. You got to wait. You got to be patient and all that stuff. When we finally put together the museum in 1994, Ron had pictures. That's where I basically solidified my faith in Ron's discoveries. And I knew that every one of them was a valid discovery. And so for two and a half years, I spoke with thousands of people that would come see the materials at the museum that I managed. And I'm pretty sure that most of them walked away saying, yep, looks good. This is absolutely incredible. And that because mm -hmm. when they came in, I'd first show them a short 40 minute film and that then guide them around the room in each section, looking at all the documentation of Noah's Ark and all the documentation for the Red Sea Crossing site. The pyramid building machine display was set up yeah. <laughs> in the room there for them to see. And Sodom and Gomorrah in the middle of the section. And we didn't have a bunch of fuzzy pictures to show people. These were totally in focus, awesome visuals. You know, it says a picture is worth a thousand words. No, these pictures we had in that museum were worth a million words. Yeah. Because when you do a Bible study that proves something from the Old Testament, you don't just stop at a thousand words. You have a lot to say about it. And all of this stuff that was in the museum there in 94 through 96, um, Ron was on the cover of Nashville Magazine showing off Noah's Ark. Well, Ron Wyatt should have been on the cover of Time Magazine. <laughs> back then, mm -hmm. showing all this stuff to the entire world. Amen. But unfortunately, there were enough naysayers still around that we couldn't get good traction. And now we're here 20 years after our good friend Ron Wyatt passed away, and we're still at it, trying to share this stuff. It's our testimony that everything we had there in that museum is totally legit and believable and of the Lord. Absolutely. Now, what's interesting I find with Kevin here is he's taken a whole bunch of tourist groups overseas. 
I've never been overseas once. I don't like to travel. I like to just sit at home, watch this stuff, see sure. pictures of it, draw yeah. and read and everything and stay in the safety of my own home. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin likes to go out and traipse around on hills and valleys and encounter all these strange people and, <laughs> you know, whatever. I mean, at one time, the tour groups who were being taken to Noah's Ark get kept being stopped by the Kurdish guerrillas with submachine guns. Yeah, 1980s. Yeah. And Ron and a few of his co-workers were even kidnapped for three weeks in 1991. It's really dangerous out in those places. And again, in Mount, the Mount Sinai thing, uh, he and his two sons locked up for 72 days. You know, I don't need that type of experience <laughs> yeah. in my life. I, I can do without that. Yeah. But... Uh, You've managed to take a lot of people overseas and that. Why don't you enumerate like how many trips you've done to which places? You recently went into Saudi Arabia. Last year, yes, the February, March, and a week after we got back, you know, the travel was shut down. But yeah, we went out to Mount Sinai, and it's exactly yes, it, it was been. Now, when you say depicted. we, it's not we. Well, okay, it's yeah. you. It was me and a couple <laughs> of friends. Yeah, we went out there, and I drove about fourteen hundred miles, going out to all the various sites. You know, Elam, the, the beach there at the crossing site, uh, the Split Rock. Went out there a couple of times. It's nine miles off the Pay Road, and you know, uh, Mount Sinai proper, seeing the wow. Golden Calf Altar also, the altar at the base of the mountain. It's just totally incredible. Um, you know, in some ways, this is better than going to Israel, aside from the Garden Tomb and the Crucifixion site. I mean, that's number one in the world. But outside that, if you were to go to Israel and not, you know, see the Garden Tomb, this Mount Sinai area is more impressive than Israel, you know, because it's it's raw, it's real, it's authentic, and not many people have been there. But uh, God's preserved it, you know, for this end time. Amen. Let me ask you, Jim. People will say, I can see Noah's Ark. Yeah, that's real. I see the pictures, the evidence. I see Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, yeah, look at the brimstone, the formations. It's in the right side according to the Bible. Uh, look at the Red Sea crossing, the chariot wheels. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, Mount Sinai, the Blackened Peak, the, the site that Herschel Shank says is the most likely site, uh, you know, editor of Biblical Archaeology Review, he says it's the most likely site for Mount Sinai. And then they say, but when it comes to the Ark of the Covenant, Ron was lying through his teeth. How does that make sense? It doesn't. Would, would God use a liar to discover all these other things? It doesn't make sense at all. It really doesn't. What it shows is the people have sort of made up their minds ahead of time as to what they expect about the ark. Like a lot of them might seriously believe that it's in a hidden chamber underneath the Temple Mount. Or some of the folks may have believed that it was taken to Ethiopia and they still have a priest that's watching the building that won't let anybody inside and says, yeah, it's still in there. Well, the thing is, it wasn't taken to Ethiopia, and Ron explained that a long time ago. Um, I don't know. It's, it's like you're touching on the most sensitive, single physical item on the planet. And I don't understand how people can see all of Ron's other discoveries and then discount what he says about the Ark of the Covenant. When I was in the museum and showing all of this to people, I'd save the Ark of the Covenant as the last thing to show them because what I wanted to do was establish mm -hmm. Ron's credibility. Exactly. In other words, here's the proof for all these other discoveries that are just mind-blowing because humanity has been waiting for centuries to see these things. Even Christians began to think that the Red Sea crossing site is a fictional story because whenever they looked over in the Gulf of Suez, there's no evidence. Mm -hmm. And so they had to fabricate a story about how God drowned the Egyptian army in, you know, six or seven inches of water. It doesn't work, guys. 
So Ron comes along and he looks over in the Gulf of Aqaba and he finds the coral covered chariot wheels, a natural underwater land bridge that extends over into Saudi Arabia where Mount Sinai is there in all of its glory and proof. Everything mentioned in scripture is right there out in the open. But fortunately, because everybody was thinking, oh, Gulf of Suez, he had the whole world looking in the wrong place. So they left the real place alone. So it can survive here until the end of time. And it's unfortunate, like with Noah's Ark, it used to be out in the open. People kept picking boards off of it and taking it home. And, you know, it sat out in the open for a thousand years and got picked apart until God decided to wash it down the hillside in a mud and lava flow, bury it so that something would be there and exist at the end of time as physical proof for Noah's Ark. He had to hide the, what was left over of it. So it would be here now in our day, day and time and that. The same thing with the Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, yeah, Josephus says the ashen remains are out in the open and he saw them. But everybody fixates on the Dead Sea and nothing's out there. And you got the mountain of Masada that has a certain story that goes along with it. But nobody looks down on all of these ashen remains and nobody even noticed the sulfur walls. Back in 1992, Ron had me write and draw his discovered Sodom and Gomorrah magazine. And we just republished it with brilliant full color pictures in it. It used to be only in black and white, but as of a year or two ago, we've got it in full color. But all the evidence is right out there because people basically left it alone because God let them believe that, you know, it's over there, but no, it's really over there. Mm -hmm. So they look somewhere else. Now, I, there is also a problem with the Ark of the Covenant because of really how sensitive it is. And Ron has included this in his talks, mm -hmm. wherein Jerusalem is really a tricky place on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, only recently reclaimed by the Jewish people. You have the Palestinian people in there. They pretty much hate each other, but are trying to coexist. The Ark of the Covenant is in the Garden Tomb area, which is in the Arab quarter. Mm -hmm. And if you talk to the people at the Garden Tomb thing, they don't believe that Ron found the Ark of the Covenant there. They, don't, they think Ron Wyatt is nuts. And so sad. But the thing is, God has used this disinformation to tone down the belief about where the Ark is so fewer people will go and try to mess with it. We've had, a, what, about 16 people over the years try to interfere in the Ark of the Covenant dig, either get into the cave or announce a news press conference. God has either killed several of them to stop it or hindered several of them to make them back off because this item is being saved for the end of time. God is going to show it to us when he's good and ready. Now, in my mind, I have this... <laughs> fantasy, <laughs> imagination thing going where I'd like to see all of the religious leaders in the world line up and go into the Ark of the Covenant cave one at a time. And let's see who comes back out alive. <laughs> sort of a cleansing? Well, it's sort of a, a, a oh. show and tell. Let's have, you know, the best man wins. And that, um, because... People that don't have the truth about the Ark of the Covenant are not going to get a chance to mess with it. Now, Ron said there are four angels that have been guarding the Ark all along. He saw them. Yeah. They're on the videotape footage, supposedly, that's in that mm -hmm. cave. Yeah. He spoke with them and that. Uh, but at some point, it'll be their job probably to show it to the world. And 
I myself am hoping that there's a supernatural presence that happens with it yes. because you've done a mock-up of the Ten Commandment stones and that with the paleo whatever paleo Hebrew mm -hmm. paleo Hebrew language lettered on it and mm -hmm. all that and if the Ten Commandment stones came out held by the angels and that and they're just standing there looking like normal men who's going to be able to look at the Ten Commandment stones and read them I don't read paleo Hebrew and pretty much hardly any of you do maybe a few people in the Israeli antiquities department still can do that but I would actually like to see a supernatural event take place like what happened at the Tower of Babel when God took humanity who had one language and then he mixed it up and turned it into 6,000 plus languages so when the Ten Commandment stones come out and you see them it's sort of like the gift of tongues in that when people actually hear what's being said in a their language so they can understand mm -hmm. in fact that happened to ron once he was over there watching television saudi arabia in saudi arabia yeah. and a guy was reading from the quran and you are not supposed to read the quran in any other language except the one that it's written in mm -hmm. ron was watching this man read the quran over tv and he was speaking english and he was talking about how Moses was considered a prophet by the Muslim people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, Ron needed that bit of information because later on he talked with the people who had locked him up in prison and all that, or jail, he and his mm -hmm. sons. And he had to make the point that the Muslims believed that Moses was a prophet. Mm -hmm. He had that bit of information, but it was only because he heard it read in English. The tongues was translated. Yes, that's to true him. tongues right there. And that's true t an example of true tongues. Mm -hmm. So when the Ten Commandments stones come out, I'm putting my request on the table here and now. <laughs> <laughs> I want the language on the Ten Commandments stones to be able to be read by everybody on the planet who sees it broadcast live around the world. If you're in Japan, you can read it in Japanese. If you're in America, you can read it in English. If you're in Korea, you can read it in Korean. I want that language translated supernaturally because that will actually be supernatural proof that these are the Ten Commandment stones. This really is the Ark of the Covenant. We'll test the blood again and they'll film the tests come through. Those chromosomes, there will only be 24 chromosomes in Christ's blood. It will prove that he was born of a virgin. Scientific validated proof that will go out to the entire world. And basically I've been, I've gotten tired of sort of arguing with people because I shared the thing about the chromosomes with a pretty much longtime friend of mine and he said, it can't be that way because Jesus had a body just like ours, which in his mind means Jesus had to have a body with 46 total chromosomes. Mm. He can't have 24. And I said, you're not making sense. Of course it makes sense that he has our body with only 24 chromosomes because 23 came from Mary and God had to provide the one Y chromosome that made Jesus a male child and that and that's all you needed and there's a certain scientific term for a reduced number of chromosomes we found in other people that have lived on the planet who weren't God <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but we've been able to study it scientifically so there's little things like that that people want to grab onto and they get this idea that they're absolutely totally right and nothing you say is going to convince them otherwise. And it's so unfortunate because we can help you understand that this stuff is real. Um, one of the books that was done about the Ark of the Covenant scenario was done by Jonathan Gray down there in Australia and New Zealand. This book, nice and thick, done in 1997. So 
we've been putting the material out there for quite a while. And we have the PDF on our website for free. Uh, Dr. Okay. Gray made it available. So people can go on arcdiscovery.com and go in the Ark of the Covenant section and get a PDF of this and you can read it uh, you know, for free. Did you put the video up also? He did. He actually did a Ark of the Covenant game video. It seemed like. Oh no, I didn't see that. Oh, I got. Okay. I got to show you that thing. Okay. I've got it somewhere. Okay. <laughs> it's really sort of clever. Early uh, special effects for game stuff okay, to go cool. through a maze and get answers. Yeah. <laughs> so the Ark of the Covenant scenario is being revealed. Ron said it would be during the the mark of the beast showdown, so to speak. He said the angel told him when the mark of the beast law was enforced, the Ten Commandments would come out, and then that videotape, and so, and then the blood, I'm sure, you know. So the blood is going to prove that Jesus was the Messiah, and that will be good for everyone on earth. I mean, most people on earth did not grow up Christians. They're not believers, so right. to speak. They need this evidence to show them Jesus really was the Messiah. He just had one earthly parent. And so they'll need to uh, forgive their sins in Jesus' name, accept Jesus as their Savior, um, pray that God and the Holy Spirit will come into their heart to control their life, and then they will be able to keep the Ten Commandments that are coming out. God wants us to follow the Ten Commandments, doesn't he? at a time when the government will be having a law against them. You know, the, the saints were, as described in Revelation 12, are keeping the Ten Commandments. So that's why they're coming out, because the world needs to keep the Ten Commandments and not follow man's law that's against them. And what's interesting about that entire situation is it's been taught on this planet for 150 years. Ron was not the first person to come up with the idea of what the Mark of the Beast was. Ron Wyatt was a Seventh-day Adventist. The Adventists have been on this planet since 1863, and they've been teaching the truth about end-time Bible prophecy. They've been teaching people to understand the importance of the Seventh-day Sabbath, that God created during creation week and blessed. And the Bible even sort of tells you that after, whoever gets to heaven and gets to inherit internal, eternal life, you're going to still be keeping the seventh day Sabbath. Amen. It's going to last through eternity because God blessed it for all eternity. But there's this little period in between on earth where a certain group of folks over in Europe hated all things Jewish so badly that they still wanted to be Christians, but they wanted to overlook the fact that Jesus was a Jew, and they wanted to do away with all things Jewish. So the idea popped into their head. Jesus came out of the tomb and was arisen on the first day of the week, which is a Sunday, so let's honor Sunday as the new day to go to church and worship Jesus with. We're not doing that old Jewish thing anymore. So a certain powerful Christian organization in Europe passed all these rules to stop people from Judaizing. Because all of the initial be believers in Jesus that came out, you know, be them Jewish or Gentile, they all knew the Seventh-day Sabbath was the only day truly blessed by God. And if you're going to worship God, you do it on the seventh day. New Testament has like nine verses that describe what was happening on the first day of the week. None of them have an order to start worshiping God on Sundays. Not one single word of it. So basically, when you get down to the end of time, this is what Ron knew. There's going to be a national Sunday law that starts in America and extends around the world, ordering people to go to church and keep Sunday holy. But as far as God cares, Sunday is just one of the common working days. When Jesus came out of the tomb early Sunday morning, what did he do? Did he 
tell everybody, oh, I got to start resting now again and that. No. Jesus he went back to work. Res he rested in the tomb on the seventh day Sabbath. He came up on the first day of the week and Jesus went back to work. Yeah. Now, Jesus was alive 40 days after the resurrection. Where is his grand announcement during that 40 days yeah. that then there's a new Sabbath? Where is you, that announcement you recorded? You think he'd mention it. <laughs> he would be the only one who could change it. He exactly. And his father. They were, they are the testators. There's the one who testified. They gave, they made a, you know, when you make a will, only the person making the will can change it. Okay, when they made this law, only they could be the ones to change it. Where's the change noted? Ron very clearly believed that at the end of time, there would be National Sunday Law that forced people to desecrate God's real Sabbath. And there'll be very few people on the planet who actually continue keeping the seventh day Sabbath because pretty much the whole world has gotten used to the idea of worshiping on Sunday. But it's not of God. It's not of scripture. It was put in place by certain powerful supposed Christian organizations that think they have power, but their power and authority has been given to them by Satan. You know, it's, it's not the truth. It's just not biblical. And that Sunday law will be the mark of the beast. And at that point, anybody who goes along with it will be accepting the mark of the beast. God tells you, don't do it. The warning against the mark of the beast is the most fearful warning in all scripture. Because God out forthrightly says, if you fall for that, and you go along with it, I will destroy you when I come. And he's not kidding around. So Ron knew this. Now, again, that's why Ron was led to all these discoveries, because Ron had a very serious understanding of the correct doctrines in Scripture. And that, but very few people wanted to come forth and actually ask Ron what he believed. And then he passed away, and now he's gone for 20 years, and you can't talk to him. But you can talk to us, because we knew him personally. We knew what he believed. I published a series of books. Kevin here is like a fourth generation Seventh day Adventist. Uh, and even though we have some problems with our church, because our church has been sort of standoffish as far as believing Ron's discoveries. Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter, Satan has been infiltrating every religious organization on the planet. Amen. He's been fouling things up, messing with people's minds, turning them away from the truth, planting doubts in their minds and everything else. And so, frankly, when you folks listen to most of the teachers on the planet who want to teach you religious stuff, there's going to be, you're going to be hearing a tainted version of the truth, probably. That's right. They're not teaching the truth. Um, it's, it's not all biblical. What I mean, Ron, Ron found the ashen remains of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah was burned with an ex, as an example of eternal hellfire. But the thing is, nowadays everybody thinks, well, you end up, if you end up in hell, you're going to end up burning eternally. That's not what the scripture teaches. The ashen remains Ron found of Sodom and Gomorrah are not still burning. What they did, fire and brimstone fell down on the five cities of the plain. They destroyed, it destroyed the people and turned the entire area to ash. And that was that area's eternal punishment being turned to ash. At the end of the millennium, when the lost end up in the lake of fire and God burns them with fire and brimstone, they do not burn forever. They burn until they're punished, until they're turned to ash, and that's it. Their eternal punishment is the fact that they will never be resurrected back to life ever again. The results are eternal. The result is eternal and God could resurrect him, but he's, he can't go against his word. He's told him, you're going to yeah. die eternally. Yeah. The, the, the wages of sin is death. 
not eternal life in hell. Yeah. So it's like Ron understood the true interpretations of these doctrines. God knew that if he brought him to find all these wonderful biblical archaeological sites, Ron would put the truth in with his witness. And that, and so, because Ron couldn't do that back then, I guess it's up to us to do it now. But, you know, it's still not too late. You folks need to hear this stuff. You need 